This is a rebroadcast of the Eau Claire School Board meeting. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. Call to order the uh, Eau Claire School Board meeting. Uh, please rise, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> all right. Uh, Secretary Iverson, have we complied with the Open Meetings Law notification? Yes, we have. All right. Would you please uh, verify quorum? Commissioner Spindler. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Cummins. Here. Commissioner Hombach Boyle. Here. Commissioner Duax. Here. Commissioner Vu. Here. Commissioner Jean. Here. Great. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, no one signed up for the public forum, so we'll be moving beyond that. Uh, next is the uh, superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. Um, as we always do, I'd like to review the upcoming Board of Education events. On uh, February 6th, which is this Friday at 7 a.m., there will be a legislative breakfast with um, Altoona School District and Chippewa Falls School District, and the breakfast will be held at Prairie Ridge Early Learning School. On February 9th at 7 p.m. in the administration building, there will be a parent advisory council meeting. On February 16th, there will be a school board meeting here in the administration building at 7 p.m. On February 17th at 4 p.m. in the administration building, there will be a meter, meeting of the Charter Choice Committee. Um, on February 18th from 12 to 1.30 at Wild Ridge Golf Course, uh, there is a luncheon uh, by the Chamber of Commer Commerce to celebrate businesses that have been in existence for 100 years and the school district will be honored as one of those businesses or organizations and then on february 19th at noon here in the administration building there will be a board luncheon with mark van clay from the consortium for educational change and that luncheon will be followed uh, by a meeting with mr van clay and uh, staff members uh, about the outcome of our systems assessment. Um, and just that I wanted to say a few words about the system assessment. Um, you know, as we started our work on Agenda 2017, um, which more or less sets out the initiatives that the state expects of us in terms of what students are supposed to learn in the standards movement with Common Core, the new assessments with the Badger exam, and the ACT Aspire suite, and our um, how students are to be taught by highly qualified educators through educator effectiveness. We had those three main initiatives to more or less organize around. And we chose to uh, more or less go after that work through a structure of our school improvement plans uh, with the work facilitated at the schools by our professional learning communities. As we got into the work, I think it became very apparent that as a central office, we weren't organized to provide support for the schools. So um, with the information that we received from the consortium for uh, educational change, I think they're going to be able to give us some recommendations um, and an assessment that will help us to organize in a way that will provide better support for our schools. And that work will start on February 19th with Mr. Van Clay's visit. I also wanted to make the board aware that over the last, oh, month or so, I've received uh, a few inquiries about our uh, closing school when dealing with severe cold. Um, and I think that, you know, it's important uh, to note that, the, and I think this policy has been in effect for quite some time, is that the district had consulted with the National Weather 
service uh, when this administrative rule was written. And at that time, a minus 30 degree uh, guideline was given. Um, there are some people who feel that that is too steep a guideline. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is when we make these school closing decisions, we're not only looking at the temperature, but we're looking at all of the conditions throughout the district. And we're looking for a sustained low temperature. Um, that is well below 20 degrees. So wanted to communicate that to you and um, to tell you that there's been quite a bit of interest um, in that perhaps we need a guideline that is a little bit less than 30 degrees. But I think the important thing to remember is we're always looking at what the conditions are at that particular moment and that's how we make our decision. The minus 30 is a guideline, it's not a rule. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for my announcements, uh, one, I just wanted to mention to board members on the legislative breakfast, if you could just let me know if you're thinking you're go you'll go, that would be great. Uh, just, just pop me an email or something or let me know after the meeting. Um, let's see. Uh, what's that? Patty oh, Patty has a list. Great. Thank you. That would be great. Uh, March 18th um, is the WASB day at the Capitol uh, where board members um, from all over the state will visit legislators on educational issues. Um, and you have a chance to sit in on committee hearings and so forth. So um, I encourage you to go. I, I've signed up. And um, if other board members want to go, it would be great. It's basically like a lobby day. So if you want, can go, that would be great. Uh, just a reminder about the uh, National School Board Meeting uh, Convention, uh, March 21st through 23rd in Nashville. Um, we have several rooms reserved if you're interested. We have several, I think right now, probably three maybe who are going. Um, but if you're, it's, the deadline's coming close, and if you want to go, you should contact Patty. Um, and finally, I think by the end of this week, we hopefully will have our compensation committees fill and, and start scheduling those meetings. So, um, so that's it for my announcements. Um, next on the, on the agenda is the student representative report. Who would like to go first? Hannah? Great. I'll start us off today. Um, first, I'd like to give a little bit of feedback on what the students think about the calendar changes. I haven't been able to make my way to all of the clubs at North, but I've gotten to a few of them. And um, for the most part, it's been about 50-50 with the response. Most students are excited about the calendar ending earlier and having a little bit longer of a summer break. The main concerns with the schedule have been um, students who have jobs and their jobs are used to starting at about 3.30 so they would have to work fewer hours and they were worried about what that might do with their income. Um, other concerns were with gym scheduling for athletes after school but those are all things that can be worked around and for the most part it's been received pretty well. Um, another thing is the retake policy <laughs> with the end of semester. Um, a lot of students were using that and I think it was really an effective policy. Um, I know a lot of students have been really happy with it and it has really maximized learning because they don't understand it the first time, they get the chance to understand it a second time. There definitely is a fine line between using it and abusing it, but um, again, for the most part, I think students have been liking that a lot. And then, just for some little extra news, less educational, um, last week, was, or this past Saturday, was North's Winter Carnival, and that really got a lot of school spirit up again. Um, I think the attendance was higher this year than last year, is what I'd heard. I hadn't heard the exact numbers or anything, but it was a pretty good turnout. A lot of people were going. People were excited about it. And then, just a little spiel for the dance team, and we'll say it for memorials, too, both of our teams qualified for state with both of our routines. So that is this Saturday at the Lacrosse Center and we perform in the morning if anyone would like to come. Congratulations. Thanks. Great. Yeah. That's a, that's a great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Jonah. Okay. So um, in the past, in the um, last week I met with, I just invited student council and some club leaders to just sit down. We thought we could, students could talk about the proposed changes to the calendar. And surprisingly, there weren't as many complaints as I had expected. And from what I've heard from most of the kids at Memorial, the complaints were mostly just about um, 
were just things when I explained it really, actually have really liked the ending at this specific time. But what, what we did come to conclusion about, even though, even though they like the changes right now, the question they pose for, for me and to pose to the board is, if it's so, not easy, but if, if, if we're able to sit down and have a comprehensive change of the schedule, and really get input from multiple sides, then why isn't it possible to do a comprehensive change in the schedule in regards to a later start for high school and, and an earlier start? And that's something that I think is something with the new changes, something we can actually take more seriously, which is a good thing. So going forward, we can look at that. We know we can sit down with the bus companies, with the other groups, and we really can understand that while well, it'll be a difficult change, it's something that we can do. It's something that changes changes need to be made, frankly. The, the board and the district really, one of their goals is to be data-driven, right? And the data and everything, everything, everything that's been put out there has been, this is beneficial for students, this is beneficial for everyone. So that's what I, that's what they had to say is just going forward, knowing that if, if changes can be made, keep this in hindsight, look at this, and in the future maybe address it. Other than that, um, dance team's going to state. Um, our winter carnival is in two weeks. The theme is New York, New York. And finally, with uh, Martin Luther King Day, the day of service, student council did not get out and go and work like they normally do to the, the late hour of things. And But what we're doing now is we're going out later in a week and a half. We're going around to different charity places around the on a Saturday and go do that as a student council. So I thought that's a very positive thing to do. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the service and, and the comments. Appreciate it. OK, uh, board committee reports. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember. Uh, policy and governance has not met, if I understand it right, since the last meeting. Budget did. Uh, do we have a budget? I don't know who would provide the budget report. Anybody? Uh, Chu, go ahead. We talked uh, budget. And referendum 101, uh, Dan went through a lot of materials, and uh, we learned a lot. There, there's times, there's a time for everything, uh, and now it's the time to start talking about the R word. I, okay, I agree. Yes. All right. Um, I don't believe charter committee has met. Correct. Uh, anything from foundation? Oh, you haven't. Wouldn't have been there. Okay. Anything else? Am I missing any other committees? Demographic and trends. We already gave a report from last time, I believe. So that's it. So, okay. So I guess we're ready for the legislative update. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just would like to bring up a couple things. Um, the governor announces his budget tomorrow. Um, he has made the announcement that he intends to include additional assistance to rural school districts in the state budget proposal. Um, when asked by reporters about K-12 funding, he did not give specifics, but said that he plans to keep funding for public schools largely intact. So we'll see what that means tomorrow. Um, because what has happened in Milwaukee has so impacted us over time, I thought it would be beneficial for you to also know that Senator Darling and Representative Kuyenga um, are in the process of unveiling a Milwaukee education reform an economic development plan. Uh, one proposal calls again for a so-called recovery school district uh, model that would turn select MPS schools with failing grades into independent charter schools that would not answer to the Milwaukee School Board. So again, that's being brought up in a different way with Milwaukee, even though um, uh, I listened, last time I reported, I listened to the AB1 hearings, I listened to all the Senate Bill one hearing two on Tuesday, and um, last week Tuesday, and very interesting. And I think a lot of people at the table, lots of good conversation relative to some of the points that um, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards um, um, were in favor of SB one in the sense that it kept control with local school boards and it also um, looked at. Um, um, not using grades 
as opposed to looking at growth over time and some of the things that they were really um, wanting to have in the bill. They also appreciated and said over and over again that SB1 did include many stakeholders within the state for input, which was not necessarily the case with AB1. Um, a little bit on the Smarter Balanced Assessment as far as the legislation goes. Um, according to news reports, the DPI is planning for the possibility that lawmakers may not fund as much because of the pullout of some states. It's made the test more expensive, so we'll see where that takes us as well. And um, that's the end of my legislative report. Great. Thank you. And some of those talk of topics will be at the legislative breakfast on Friday also. All right, so now we're up to the consent resolution agenda. Um, we'll consider these items. Um, board members have fur been furnished background on this already or have discussed it at a previous meeting. They'll be acted on with one vote without discussion, but a board member may pull any item if they wish. So I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of January 19th, 2015. A pull motion that. to pull that. Pull that. Okay. A motion to approve the minutes of the closed session, January 19th. 15. A motion to approve the Human Resources Employment Report. And a motion to approve the uh, revisions of Policy 460 Student Scholarships and Awards. Okay, I'll enter a motion for those, those three besides the minutes. So moved. We have a motion. Do I have a second? We have a second from Commissioner uh, Vu. And uh, let's see. Yes, we can do a voice vote on this. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, unanimous. So, uh, Commissioner Duex, you had pulled the minutes of January 19th. Um, did you have a question about those? I'm looking for it right now, but there's one place where everyone's addressed by their last name except Charles Vu, and I wanted to correct that, and I wrote a note on here, but I'm... I can't seem to find my note, but uh, okay. Let's see here. It was within the same sentence, I think. Um, um, I'm not sure where it is, but I can, I'll find it later. But I see. just felt like that it needs be to be more consistent. So that if everybody's all. using the last name and then uh -huh. it was using Charles' first name, so certainly, certainly. Okay, I'll find it. Thank you. Okay. So I move approval. Uh, so you move approval, and so you basically want to make comment just to watch for that. In the yeah. Future. Okay. Do second. I do I have a second? We have a second from is that Commissioner Zhang? Yes. Okay. All right. All those in favor of approving those minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, Commissioner Duax. All right. So we will now adjourn to committee for our committee reports. Um, first up is we have a discussion on high school credits and the graduation requirements. Um, we have new requirements coming down from the state. Uh, so I assume uh, Mr. Leibum will be presenting something about that, looks like. Yes, thank you. There are. Uh uh, others with me tonight, we're going to provide you a um, general overview of the statutory changes that have occurred in 2013 that affect um, the earning of high school credit and then the high school graduation requirements uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I'll provide you a brief overview of the statutory changes. Uh, Jim Schmidt will give you some data regarding uh, how those um, changes will affect the percentage of students who are currently meeting the standard or are going to need to increase their credit attainment to graduate. Uh, and then Diana Zegers at the middle school and uh, the two Daves from the high schools will share some uh, program implications and changes that are currently underway uh, and being investigated in response to these, to these changes. <clears throat> so uh, in 2013, uh, the state legislature enacted Act 63, and Act 63 increased the graduation requirements uh, in math and science from two to three. So in the Eau Claire Area School District, as was presented to you earlier this school year, uh, we currently have a two credit graduation requirement in math that will need to increase by one credit uh, with the class of 2017 current sophomores. And in science, we'll need to increase by half a credit 
Uh, while the state requirement is two credits to graduate, the Eau Claire School District has had for a long time two and a half credits uh, to graduate in science. So the top uh, English, social studies, math, science, physical, physical education, and health, those uh, 15 credits are required mandatory credit earnings uh, for a high school diploma in the state of Wisconsin. And then the DPI recommends an additional eight and a half credits uh, of other or elective courses <clears throat> for a high school graduation. Again, that eight and a half is not required. It is encouraged uh, by the DPI. In addition to Act 63, it's not only increasing the math and science requirements uh, for graduation, but how you earn or what qualifies as a math or science a credit. Um, currently, uh, as long as it meets a district program of study requirement, uh, which is either a licensure standard or it's a crosswalk based on uh, skill development and testing, uh, you could earn a math credit uh, in computer science or a career, in technical, career or technical education course. And in science, you could earn, again, one of the three credits in a career or technical education course. Uh, so again, uh, there's a vetting process through that. Uh, there are certification issues we look at. There are competencies that have to be demonstrated by the teacher in order to uh, meet that standard. Uh, there are exit, exam, or um, performance criteria that go along with it. So it's just not a, a real simple process. Uh, but that uh, Act 63 does allow some flexibility of one of the three credits in both math and science. <clears throat> act 138 is specific to the middle school, and included in that act is that um, high school credit can be earned by students in grades seven and eight uh, who take a course that is taught by a content licensed teacher using an equivalent uh, curriculum and assessment battery, and that a district can include all or none of the following on the high school transcript for the student, the name of the course, the credit earned, the grade earned, and GPA points if so desired. Again, that's what the statute states. That doesn't mean we would need to enact if we went down this path uh, any one or all of those conditions. The board will need to consider um, at a minimum policy implications relative to policy 345.6 and the associated rule uh, because currently that policy and rule reflect a lower graduation credit requirement in both math and science. Another implication uh, that has been brought up in the past that the board may want to consider is whether or not to increase graduation requirements uh, from 22 to some number uh, greater. When we look at our comparables, uh, the top column is the Big Rivers Conference, and you can see that um, Superior and Eau Claire, uh, the first column is what uh, schools currently have for their graduation requirements, uh, and the column on the right is what they are proposing for the future. Some will be enacting this with the sophomore class of 2017. Others will be uh, implementing it with the class of 2020, our incoming eighth graders. Uh, but you can see that Superior had also been at 22 credits. They will be increasing to 23. And Eau Claire, we left open uh, not knowing where we might be. Uh, the other schools in the Big Rivers Conference already had 23 or more credits required for graduation. And then we made a few calls to some uh, comparable districts. And again, you can see them there. And other than Green Bay and Oshkosh, who are currently at 22 credits and will maintain 22 credits for in the future, uh, all the other districts have either been at 23 or more uh, for graduation requirements or are increasing their requirements from 22 to 23 uh, or lacrosse 22 and a half to 24, uh, Janesville 24.5 to 26.5. Uh, so generally the trend you can see is districts are in fact, uh, if they are below the 23 standard minimum, they're increasing, uh, otherwise they're maintaining their current graduation requirements. Then I will. Uh, yep. Are any of those schools uh, have eight period days? Uh, yes, the two, um, both River Falls and Rice Lake have a block schedule. Um, I believe they're both straight four hour block uh, um, schedules. So like Janesville and La Crosse don't have eight periods in their day, they have seven? Some may have eight, some would have seven. So we don't know which, <laughs> no. certainly that would allow, I mean, if you had an eight period day, if you had a study hall, you could still get six credits and have that, a study hall. Correct. 
or you could take seven classes, right? You could get up to 28 and still have a study hall in an eight period day. Mm -hmm. And if you were to have a study hall each year um, in a seven period day, that would then be the 24 credits. Yep. So with that, uh, we'll turn that over to uh, Jim to talk about where we're at uh, relative to math and science credits. Good evening. Um, I'm going to blitz you with some numbers and I'll summarize them real quickly. But we looked at the requirement for three credits in both math and science <clears throat> and compare that with our graduates from the, or our, <clears throat> I should be careful, our seniors, um, because you'll notice that some are under the graduation requirement of two for math and two and a half for science because our graduation rate, four year rate, is around uh, about 86%. Um, so this is a breakdown of, of the data over all those different grade, or, um, credit distributions. <clears throat> but in summary, um, we have just over two-thirds of our students um, in the last two years and about three-quarters of them uh, back in 11-12 that were actually, this should actually say at or more than three credits. So these are the percentage of students that would meet the math requirement currently um, as they, as they um, completed their 12th year. And this is the percentage that would not have met that requirement. So we've got about a two-third to one-third split. So two out of every three are going to be okay on math. And close to that same number, um, but a little little bit, uh, obviously 11, 12, the numbers are a bit higher, but we've fallen a little bit off that the past couple of years. Um, looking at overall credits, you know, as Tim was mentioning, um, 23 credits for uh, um, some of, like, uh, one of the schools moving to. We broke down our, um, this is the percentage of students earning 22 total credits, <clears throat> regardless of area, um, our current graduation requirement. Then we looked at what, if, how many of those were earning 23 from that graduating class and how many were earning 24. So this is just those, not 22 or more, this is just the number of just 22, okay? This is the column of at least 23. So 23, 23 and a half, 24, et cetera. And this is at least 24 credits. So you get a sense of, and then we broke it down by school. Combined is just the district as if it was one large high school. So these are the data for um, you know, 23 or more, 24 or more. This is just 22. And again, over the past uh, five graduating classes. And you can see ballpark, um, you know, one in, one in five, roughly, um, over the, if you average it over the past five years, uh, would not be meeting 23. Yes? Any idea why there's a change the last two years? It seems to be um, more kids just graduating as opposed um, to again, having. If these are, if you look though over here, so this was just 22. Um, you look over here, the number, so like if you look at, at this number here, the ones with 23 or more actually went up. So we were just looking at that one band of just the kids that were just hitting the bare minimum. Um, but then if we just look at the ones making um, above that, it's actually increased over the, um, this average was 77, 78, 84, 81, and 86. So on average, the number of kids hitting 23 credits has actually increased over the past few years. Um, the number hitting 20. Uh, I don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, the wrong direction. It's going down, right? I'm sorry. Uh, you're Flipped increasing. That. Sorry. Yep, went the reverse direction. Went from 86% down to 77. I apologize, yeah. yes. That's what I get for reversing my numbers. And um, likewise, 66, 61, 67, 60, 50. So we got a little bit of a peak here, and then we got a little bell curve on the 24 credit group. And no, I'd have to dig further. This is just straight numbers. Not There's no um, insight into the rationale as to why. All right, uh, Diana Ziegers will talk about middle level implications. Thank you. I'm sharing um, information tonight on behalf of my two colleagues, Principal O'Reilly and Principal Scootley. We've been spending some time together this year talking through middle level programming structures and schedules, um, and so this is actually timely. I think it's important when we start thinking about what will children need to leave our institution that we're talking about the things that lead up to entering high school. Um, a few of the bullet points come from some some studies, and on the there are some links provided for you um, to, as to where these come from. Then I'll go back to the bullet points. Um, there's some information in the Common Core Standards for Mathematics, and I'm going to sort of just talk specifically about that this evening. Um, 
but in the front matter of an appendix that sort of gives some guidelines about how children will come to master and it hopefully exceed um, the standards for math. There's another study um, out of the um, Epic Policy Research Center by David Conley, sort of the guru on defining college and career readiness and talks about the um, academic skills and academic behaviors necessary to be successful post-secondary regardless of what that step is. And then of great interest to me now, um, a study by ACT that I think was published in the year 2008 called The Forgotten Middle. And the study reviews the importance of what children need at the end of eighth grade if they have a, a hope to be able to become post-secondary or take advantage of rigorous coursework in college or in high school. So the first two points there, all students at or above benchmark by grade eight and students developing the academic behaviors essential for school success come out of the ACT study. So the, um, if you were to investigate that, you would see that children, when they are at or above academic benchmark in reading, math, writing, um, will see great acceleration in high school. In other words, they will grow at a rate that is above the norm. When children enter high school below the benchmark, they are not likely to hit sort of the one point, for example, in ACT per year. So the gap will widen based on how they exit eighth grade. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure all of our students are at or above benchmark when we send them to high school so that they can pursue rigorous programming. The study also shows that right after that, what would be the next piece of uh, skill that we could give our students, and it's the development of a, a group of skills called academic behaviors, and these are sometimes referred to as sort of grit, perseverance, time management, that, that pool of skills, and if you were to go to that link, you'd be able to see them delineated in the research. Um, the next two bullets sort of come out of that, um, what will they be aspiring to? And so all students coming out of eighth grade um, and their families should understand the elements of a program of study, and the high school principals will talk about that a little bit more. But when they are selecting classes for their freshman year, they need to be doing so with an understanding of what lies before them. Um, and also have had exposure to and emerging ideas about their options for post-secondary. So not only what could I maybe acquire while I was in high school, but where do I want that next step to be? And what will that be as a, a, a new graduate versus a five-year graduate and on throughout my career? So we have, um, we have to provide those opportunities to kids at the middle level. The bullet there about the middle level mass sequencing um, is based on, I guess, the construction of the Common Core Standards in math. And so the design of those standards was really a K-8 and then a high school model. And the thinking is that if we can provide students with the strongest, deepest foundation for mathematics in a way that sort of makes sense and is coherent, up through eighth grade, they will be able to have deep exploration of mathematics in high school and beyond. So when we think about our program at middle level, we need to do so based on the recommendations of the Common Core State Standards. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you an example of a sequence that is an, um, representative of our current practice. And then the final bullet point talks about the importance that when we are talking with students and their families at middle level through high school and beyond that our message is clear and consistent. So what the math teacher at sixth grade might recommend or talk to a family about would be similar to what a school counselor would talk about would be similar to what the high school principal would be talking about. So those uh, resources are there for you to peruse. Um, in trying to figure out how to talk recently, um, I was with some of our staff at South and in were fifth grade families trying to determine what are we going to do with our children as we select our sixth grade option. And um, although we tend to read from left to right, this is a chart that actually reads kind of from right to left. And what I'm sharing with you is a draft. It's not the finished product, but might be an example of a way that we could share this with our community um, that would give them the whole trajectory. So over on the far right where it says college core preparatory sequence, you're looking at what students in our district would take in what we I guess we would call the universal or typical pathway. And the goal is that children who did that pathway would emerge from our system college and career ready. They would have the skills needed to enter any post-secondary institution with no need for remedi remedial coursework. Um, and so we've, we've constructed through the math rollout um, 
a series of courses and supports that we believe will get our students to that goal. You'll also notice that the kind of the end option there in 12th grade would kind of go into an elective pool which could include one or more of these courses because of course by the senior year there are many sort of holes to fill in the schedule. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that a student could only take one course, they may take multiple. Um, but pre-calculus, um, project lead the way, digital electronics, and also not included up here, so again in draft, is AP Stat. So those would be options that students could take in their senior year. Um, and then if we work our way to the left, you see that there's an option there where families could have a sort of a more typical middle level experience and then do some doubling up in their high school experience. Um, then one more to the left is if a student at, for example, sixth grade entered into a more um, typical sequence, they could reach algebra, sort of the high school algebra course, by eighth grade and then proceed to um, an AP calculus experience. Um, and then the furthest to the left is the one where um, students have a significant acceleration starting at grade six. There's a lot of data that gets collected and communicating with families to try to determine if that's the right thing to do for that child. It involves a lot of compacting on the early end. So this would be an example of a tool that we could potentially develop for the areas that we're talking about where there are some opportunities for advanced coursework in high school um, that might help people see the multiple pathways toward that post-secondary preparation. Diana, uh, it, it seems like we do a lot of the sequences already, right? This is, in, this is current practice. Yep. Yep. Right. So what you're okay, looking so that's at current. is yes. just, yep, it's just a yeah. way to organize yep. current practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quick question for you. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage that is doing the far left here right now? We have, I, this was just at a meeting, and I think it may be something about like 11%. They may not, that's kind of starts. So they may or may not get through the Calc BC. They're kind of in the pipeline. Um, so again, that's based on really a pre-Common Core world when the standards were not quite as rigorous as we have now. So as children began to move through our programs, as children exit elementary more ready, um, we're probably going to see some of these things change because our universal program should be representative of a more rigorous set of standards. Um, yeah. We can get you the specific number. Pam Cernaki keeps that, that data um, historically for us. Okay, so um, in response to that, then, the principals have been working, um, the five secondary principals have been working to try to support some policy language that would um, support children as they move through our, our program, specifically around the, the element of credit. And so a lot of discussion happened, um, not only among our administrative team, but in talking with our department chairs and instructors in these areas, as we've been trying to gather feedback on sort of the do no harm. So we don't want to put things in place that would cause a negative impact to students that was unforeseen down the road relative to any of the components that sort of Tim was sharing. So what you see is some verbiage, um, and there's four pieces to this process um, that, that we'll ask you to consider. So the first one talks about how credit will be awarded. And so where we have arrived is that there are four courses, Algebra, Geometry, Biology, and World Language One, um, which students can take and earn credit for high school. Those would kind of fall into that 8.5 credits that um, Tim was talking about, into that elective pool. Um, regardless of the courses taken at middle level, students would still need to meet the three credits in high school in both science and math. So that sort of reiterates for me why it's important for younger students to know the sequence. So know when you jump into the, you know, whatever track that is, these would be the options on the back end that you need to consider. Um, and then have directed them to the academic and career planning guide as we make changes to our curriculum to meet the need. Part B, um, 
in the recommendations from the Department of Public Instruction, then it becomes a matter of what should go on the transcript and how might this affect a student's GPA. Knowing that a seventh grade student taking algebra may not be at the same sort of level of maturity and developmental um, responsibility as a high school student would be. So what ought we do with GPA? So we have arrived at um, following what really the DPI has recommended, although they didn't put it into the act. And that is that the transcript will refl reflect that the course was taken, but the grade earned will not be calculated into the high school GPA. So if you were to look, you would see that the child has taken algebra, it appears, or has taken geometry, but then the GPA points begin calculating at grade nine. Okay, and then the final two points. High school courses delivered in the middle school will adhere to the same curriculum and assessment practices as used in the high school course. And I can say with a high degree of confidence that through um, curricular work in world language, that, that we will arrive at that being the case, I believe, by the end of the school year for the implementation of this policy. Algebra and geometry have been parallel for the last two years um, with the rollout of our new series, um, CPM Math. And um, I can't actually speak to biology tonight, not because it's not in place, but I just haven't been as involved in that project. So I think we're close. I'm just not sure if we're quite at the spot of um, sort of all of our assessments in common. And then the final piece, and this was, um, I think, important to all of us, but in particular, um, the middle school principals, is what, what do we do if the child has um, attempted to challenge him or herself, or that was a family level decision and it didn't work out? So what what options would that family have? And so there's language in here about how the grade um, and the uh, course could be expunged from the high school transcript, and that would be a conversation between the family and the middle level principal to occur during that summer following um, when the family, or when the student has taken the course. And then at that point, sort of is the, the end of that process, and then going forward, they'd be working with their high school um, principals based on what was on the transcript. So that's going to conclude my section. Any questions before I? Yes, we have questions for me. Um, Commissioner John. Um, so if it's it, uh, taking those four middle school or four high school credits at middle school would count towards their elective credits, but not their GPA, I guess I could imagine the main reason for taking them um, would be to meet a college requirement, at least the world language. So will colleges accept that Spanish one in eighth grade as one of the two years that they want students to take to get into their institution? So in the process of advising, that's always a question about um, it's important to check with the receiving institution because depending on how selective the institution is, there are some additional recommendations certainly and requirements that the university might have. But that was a bit of a move toward why having it on the transcript was important because in current practice, they take the course as eighth graders, but it doesn't show. So some universities want to see both on the transcript so that it denotes that the child did take the course at some point in their, um, in their process. Um, the same thing would be true in math. Like most admissions would assume that if you know your transcript reflects Calc BC, that somewhere you took algebra and geometry. But this would be sort of to make that more official. Would the grade show there as well if it's not calculated into the GPA? So based on how we have the policy constructed, it would. So it would show, you know, seventh grade algebra A, but it's just not calculating. Commissioner Duex. Well, I'm sure you can speak to the math process, but in languages, usually English included, you have to test on it and show what level you're at, even if you've had the coursework. At the receiving institution? That's the case in a num sometimes it'll be reading math, language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends a little bit on AP courses yep. taken also. So, uh, Commissioner Cummins. Um, it's not so much of a question as a concern or a... Um, a desire moving forward. I am absolutely in favor of the lifting of the rigor. Um, but when we have this reported back to us, uh, I think it's going to be important to make sure that we, I would always like to see the data on what percentage of students who are taking advantage of this option are coming from free and reduced and minority backgrounds and or minority, actually both pieces of data. So for instance with Mr. Schmidt's 
data from before when we were looking at what percentages of students are already um, exceeding those requirements. I think as part of our vision and wanting our vision to come true, to always have that, that we're not having to ask, okay, but what about the free and reduced? Because when we did the State of the Schools report and we saw that linked to um, IEPs and gifted education, I think the majority of the board was very surprised, by, or especially the AP number, the percentage of students that were taking AP classes that were coming from um, a free and reduced background was embarrassingly low. So I just would like it to become just a matter of fact that we always see that linked. Um, and with the second bullet, and I think by doing that we're going to be helping our whole middle school um, team identify more kids, but also on that second bullet, I mean, as a parent, May 1st to August 1st can go really fast. And so if there is a grade that probably should be um, expunged, can, can the school be more proactive in saying, in contacting the family and saying, listen, you know, you might want to take care of this um, just so we get, you know, I just, I, my worry about this is that it's going to be the parents who are on the ball that are gonna help their students take advantage of this. And we're just gonna keep, keep our gap. So, but in terms of just the rigor, great. Uh, excellent comments. Uh, other questions about this particular, oh yes, go ahead, Hannah. Um, I have a question about how the um, credit would be expunged if a student would like, yeah, okay. So um, would it be the entire credit or could it be a half credit if they just would like to retake the second semester of a course or just retake the first semester? if they understood part of it and didn't understand another part of it. Because in high school, you can retake a semester of a course. So how would that work the we same way? We haven't gotten to that, that level of detail um, <laughs> yet in the conversation. I think the, the spirit of the policy is that we want families to have the option to exercise accessing the course again if it was determined. So you know, even if the grade is fine, OK, so B or something, I still don't think I've met, I'm not quite ready to move on. So the conversation would be probably happening on the end of the middle level, and then through that, maybe we need to expunge it, you need to retake the second semester of the course or something. But we'll note that maybe that needs to be more clear. Okay. okay. Um, it sounds like that's, an Yep, that's we have questions for you. Uh, I have a question going back earlier. To yep. another, so if, if we're done asking questions of Diana. Okay. Um, one thing we, I assume you do want a discussion on a little bit is um, whether or not we should increase the graduation requirement, right? That's one thing that we will eventually have to decide, correct? Yes, and uh, probably before you have that discussion, you may want to hear from the high school principals. Ah, okay, let's go on to that. That's the next part of the... Okay, go for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're here to talk a little bit about, uh, as Tim was talking about earlier, Act 63 does allow districts to um, count a math class or a career and technical education class for math credit. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at the high school. Uh, there's a link up here, and if I can just uh, take you to there briefly, this is the link to uh, Project Lead the Way. And both high schools have been uh, incorporating Project Lead the Way coursework into our curriculums for several years. In fact, a year ago, following uh, an audit process, both schools were again recertified as schools of excellence in Project Lead the Way. Project Lead the Way is a national curriculum. It is uh, pretty much the state-of-the-art uh, STEM-based curriculum. And so what you're going to hear tonight is not only a way to award uh, one of the three credits potentially in math from a Project Lead the Way course, but it's a little bit bigger than that what we're trying to build. Um, with our emphasis on trying to build a, a, a very vibrant STEM program at the high schools, we're also looking to um, create uh, uh, at both high schools a STEM team, so to speak, where we would have um, 
one of our math teachers, a, a science teacher, and a member of our tech ed departments that would be meeting regularly and looking at uh, the impact of these courses in, in, uh, in our STEM program. So um, this happens to be Project Lead the Way Engineering. Project Lead the Way has programs in multiple areas. We've been focusing on engineering. And so I'll just scroll through here briefly and you can kind of see what some of their program offerings are. Project Lead the Way Gateway is the middle school version of the engineering program. Um, we are here in uh, PLTW Engineering. Uh, it takes you through the curriculum. It gives a good overview. In essence, what Project Lead the Way does in terms of its curriculum is it's very uh, high, it has high rigor in the math and the sciences and it's very hands-on. Um, in fact, about a year ago, we, we were at, a, at uh, CVTC, we had a, uh, a, uh, a conference there with counselors and we had a student panel. And one of our students described uh, his uh, principles of engineering class as, in his words, it was uh, uh, physics on steroids. So he enjoyed the hands-on, but it's, it's pretty intense with a lot of uh, math and science. So we are currently running four classes in Project Lead the Way Engineering. This is not a quote like a program, it's a series of courses. So these courses, um, uh, first of all, the teachers are very highly trained. They receive very specific training for these courses. And then at the end, there's an assessment and a portfolio that if our students meet, meet the benchmark uh, for that, they can earn uh, transcripted credit at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. And from there, they can then transfer that to other post-secondary institutions. So that's kind of why our focus has been on Project Lead the Way. Uh, it's been part of our tech ed curriculum, uh, but we are looking to offer we're in discussions now with members of our science staff, uh, tech ed departments, and math departments. And we're looking at, specifically in math, offering or wanting to offer digital electronics as a math credit. It's a year-long course, again, highly rigorous. Um, and um, that we're proposing could be, as part of this Act 63, be an option for students to use that course as one of their three required uh, math credits for graduation. So. Mr. Vaughn, yes. could you speak a little bit about computer science? Yes, computer science is another one here, and I'll just kind of go here. This is another one that, uh, as Tim mentioned earlier, part of Act 63, uh, it can be a computer or uh, career technical education course. Here's computer science. Um, Earlier this fall, I, I just did a search on, on this Project Lead the Way course, and it's very intense. I mean, there, there's a, there's a uh, very, very rigorous curriculum. We would really have to talk with our, uh, whether it be our business ed department, um, tech ed department. Um, you really want and need people that really love this, that are willing to go off and get trained because it's very intensive training. Um, and so that could be an option too that we would be looking at and this could also serve as a math credit. Uh, these courses in Project Lead the Way, there's, a, there's a, uh, a link in here where it can actually take you to uh, standards and it helps kind of crosswalk and align everything to, to show the rigor that is in, embedded in these courses. But this is, would be another option. We've been working mainly in the engineering program to this point but looking at this also. So in, <clears throat> excuse me, so in the high schools, <clears throat> we offer four courses in Project Lead the Way now. We offer digital electronics, which is a class that, as Dave mentioned, can be crosswalked uh, and taught for a math credit by a tech ed teacher with the curriculum crosswalk, or it could be taught by a math teacher who's highly trained, and we could award math credit for that. Principal, Principles of Engineering is another course that we can also do a credit where either a science teacher or a technical education teacher in a crosswalk um, curriculum could, or, could offer science credit. We offer, also offer Intro to Engineering and Design and Civil Engineering, CE and Architecture. The idea of adding these courses and um, uh, tying math and science credit with that would be to increase the enrollment for the student so the student is not only a given techn technical educational credit, but then math or science credit to suffice towards graduation requirement. 
but then it also would we discern increase the enrollment so it would give us more flexibility to offer additional sections and equally as important a goal at both high schools is to have all of our students graduate with an, a, with an articulated transcripted or advanced placement uh, credit experience before they graduate and this would give us significant more options in being able to expand the curriculum and expand the uh, opportunities for our students at both schools to have that experience you know along with that um, I mentioned the stem team we're trying to form uh, there are some other classes listed in the in the engineering offerings that we typically have not been able to run but our hope too is that if we can have a math teacher and a science teacher in our tech ed departments kind of working as a team together that within the schools they can help promote the rigor of these programs as an example students going on to engineering you know they, they'll take they'll, they'll take the physics and in a lot of AP science courses they should be in principles of engineering and so uh, I think that will help, uh, we, we think, uh, build, the, build the structure of the program. And then there are some courses um, that could go back into tech ed that we just haven't been able to run. Computer integrated manufacturing is one that we would love to see run. And so those series of courses, if we can even grow it more, would I think build a pretty strong STEM program. So, and then this team, the last part about this team is we work with a, um, uh, a community group that's an advisory group uh, for our STEM program and it consists of many of the employers in the Chippewa Valley. And so we would like this group to be part of that, that they could come in and, and kind of share what we're doing in Project Lead the Way, get some feedback from industry about where the trends are going. So that's how we'd like to kind of not only build an opportunity for math credit but kind of build a bigger STEM program and in our meetings with this um, this group representing the Chippewa Valley um, the industry leaders have talked about their interest in value adding or supporting the coursework with uh, student experience in the workplace with uh, those that are in the field coming in and uh, providing their expertise to our classroom teachers uh, pro providing us for, with additional um, technical uh, equipment in the buildings and then of course the most important piece may be gifting to the either North or Memorial as these programs grow and as we create a really truly interdepartmental experience within the district it's uh, within the high schools it's really um, invigorating and it's fascinating to watch the development of a science technology and math interdepartmental um, uh, offering where we've got stakeholders from all across the buildings buying into this 21st century growth growth in technology I just questions. want I just wondered about the funding what kind of funding do you need to be able to fully implement That's a good question <laughs> depending on the course just there's some courses the more introductory courses we've got the um, we've got the tools in place for the most part to offer fairly rigorous curriculum as you grow some of these courses digital electronics for example there's more expense that goes with that the equipment comes more technical more detailed there's a couple of engineering courses that Dave alluded to um, higher and technical courses including a capstone experience that would be significantly expensive to do so so before we'd have that undertaking you know, we, we, we involve the stakeholders we you know, see what the path is we knock on Dan's door buy a lottery ticket or two and see what we can do to come up with the funding for that um, but that'd be part of the growth model for for all the programming that programs that we offer at Memorial and North well what I had in mind was some of these these people that are in the advisory group and getting them involved in uh, our public school foundation a a absolutely and that's some of the conversation that we've had with this group that dr. Hardebeck has helped lead us with a group when we met uh, over at Plank in the, in the fall mm -hmm. last spring. And there is interest out there in doing so from, from this consortium. Yeah, we have committed quite a few funds over the years to primarily the software in these classes. Uh, the, some of these software programs are probably at the very top in terms of uh, what we need. I mean, the, the level that, that is needed that uh, to keep current with some of the industry software so yeah we've had to commit a you know a fairly sizable amount of money to, to maintain that and stay current um, 
I think this is really exciting. Uh, I was an engineering student. I wish I had these <laughs> when I was in high school. You know, one of the one of the hallmarks of understanding is being able to transfer knowledge from one to somewhere else, right? And that's true understanding of content. And what's great about this is that these do that. You know, you've had a math course maybe, but you haven't showed that you can transfer it besides what you've been given day to day. And these are great in showing that understanding and learning how to do that. So I, I'm really supportive of this. And I'm glad you're reaching out to other collaborators because that will be really important for our community who will also support our schools even more as we do that. So thank it's you. It's really an opportunity for us to expand our internship programming too, that we have rigorous internship experiences within both schools. But they fit into a, traditional silos. And working with this group, it's been educational and informative for them to learn that they can employ students that are under 18 that are in a um, uh, intern experience in certain areas in their building. And that, that was uh, informational for them, and they were real affirming with the um, idea of offering additional intern opportunities for, for students at both of our schools. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Hamill, go ahead. I just have a question. When you mentioned the industry leaders, has that been part, that connection and that participation within our community has that been pretty robust? We have another meeting coming up. We will uh, see how many of those attend with us, but we do kind of give them this kind of an update. And right to, the, to this point, it's been more just discussion about trends and exploratory. exploring more. Uh, but as Dave talked about, um, you know, we have talked with them about, uh, you know, more um, uh, internship opportunities for our kids. So we're just kind of like what is what is the where is the field going this is what we're looking at this is the curriculum uh, they're very supportive of it in general uh, the whole stem education they're very uh, supportive of so just so far more discussions about what we are doing and some of the suggestions they might have uh, for us is that the same group that did the study about closing the workforce gap within the Chippewa Valley are they some of the same players you know I no. no, these are the actual manufacturers that we've been talking with in terms of, you know, where they see where they see the need for future jobs and opportunities for students. Okay. Um, and I think also kind of looking at their recruitment and retention, uh, you know, what positions, what highly skilled positions they cannot find in the Chippewa Valley. So the report that you're talking about had to do with the Economic Development Council. Okay. So maybe we should get them together. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that finishes the presentation. So um, I guess we do need a, at least a short discussion about uh, the graduation requirement. Um, I don't know if I have Tim. I, I got a question for you about something earlier, kind of related to that. I'm just wondering. Um, and I don't know if this can be articulated or not, but you know, are there, are there like philosophies about whether or not having a higher graduation requirement is good or bad? I mean, are there any out philosophies about that? I mean, what are the arguments to and for? Because uh, I, I really don't know a, a basis to to talk about or to discuss, and maybe other board members do, but I don't. Um, I don't think there is a like a research-based theory on the numbers in general based on experience the students who are graduating with fewer credits oftentimes are looking to um, uh, minimize a workload uh, or to um, um, do a minimum to get through school uh, which then limits the number of courses they take that might find uh, interest uh, or that in fact would further develop their skills uh, in certain areas. Um, we also currently have in terms of the way the schedule is and we presented this earlier in the year uh, we have a very credited course heavy freshman and sophomore year and a course light junior and senior year. Now the rigor of some of those courses the junior and senior year are greater but I don't know if it's necessarily corresponding to what a ninth grader experience is in ninth grade versus a 12th grader in 12th grade. 
Yes, uh, Superintendent. Uh, um, I would add to that, too, that um, when there's a lower number of credits that are required for graduation, students tend to focus in the core areas uh, in order to complete their graduation requirements. By expanding the number of credits that you require for graduation, it opens up more opportunities and expectations for students to take elective courses, and in doing so, to explore. It gives uh, greater access to information and experience than having just a minimum number of credits that are really revolving around those core, core courses. So in a way it forces them to explore. <laughs> it, it does. It forces yeah. them to explore. Okay. Other comments or questions from board members on this? Commissioner Johnson? Well, if you wait long enough, my opinion doesn't count. But um, the things that I would want to know would be, you know, of the, of the kids who are just barely graduating, um, you know, with 22 only or 20 and two and a half, if there's a correlation with grade point averages or attendance rates or, you know, whether it takes them five or six years to graduate, because I imagine that, um, you know, the kids that are doing 23, 24 plus, you know, th that wouldn't affect them already. Um, it, it's going to affect the kids that are on the bubble and so if we're you know kids are already struggling to graduate in four years you know and that's the group we're talking about forcing them to take you know six classes a year so only one study hall um, maybe they need two study halls maybe they are working after school maybe they've got child care responsibilities maybe they don't have a conducive place to do homework maybe they don't have internet access there's all sorts of barriers and so I, you know, I worry that, I mean, it's not the kids who, you know, can handle the extra pressure and workload that are, are going to be forced to take more credits. If it's 22 or 24, they're probably still going to be graduating with 24 or 25, no matter what the requirement is. So I'm, I I'm, would be most concerned with those kids that are, you know, kind of at risk. And, you know, by bumping it up to 24 now, does it become all of a sudden unattainable and they give up altogether? Or, um, you know, they end up getting a GED instead, and um, I think that would be a real disservice to those kids, um, you know, by just assuming that they're going to be more challenged and be able to handle that challenge. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bull. <coughs> well, regarding the questions whether we need to raise the, uh, the uh, numbers of credits, my general impression is yes, I believe we need to, and I'm ready to vote on as soon as we can. My reason for saying that is because, just reading between the line, I believe it's the value of this community to push for all students to be prepared after high school, prepare for college, prepare for career, prepare for military service. And I am also assuming that the bulk of the people in this community want their children to go to technical college or college. So if we were to prepare for post-secondary education all the way to college, we need to set high expectation for our students. For me, it's not even a question if you raise that uh, numbers of credit or not, it's a must. So I'm ready to move on and vote. Well, we won't be voting anything tonight, but thank you for the opinion, yes. Uh, okay, Commissioner Johnson. I guess it depends. <laughs> Are we meeting all of the the standards required to meet those um, aspirations with the mandatory required classes. I just sat down with my son yesterday, and he's looking at his eight and a half, you know, elective credits, or you know, he's got to take once one study hall, and so he's looking at my required courses as a sophomore, and he's trying to decide between. We think he's going to be a lawyer. Maybe he's going to be in business, but he's certainly going to be using his verbal skills. So we're looking at. Does he take a pottery in case he wants to go to Minnesota instead of Madison or another Wisconsin school? Or does he take, you know, accounting? He doesn't really like math and probably will never be an accounting major. Does he take, I mean, does he take Vietnam War um, because he, you know, really likes uh, Mr. Bernhardt and thinks history is pretty cool? And so the things that he's adding to his schedule behind the requirements aren't necessarily the things that are going to help him when he gets to college. It, it, the, the core classes are the, are, that everybody takes is what's going to prepare him for college. So whether it's, you know, he has two or three of those extra classes, 
whether it's two or three, I'm not sure that that's going to give him any additional skills um, that he would need to succeed. Commissioner John. i like to see the uh, breakdown of those at-risk students of not being able to pass. i like to just know some of the barriers that we're dealing with here because like some of my uh, colleagues have said, we don't want to widen that gap that uh, that we currently have and uh, I, I don't know if I am ready to to vote. I, I know uh, Commissioner Vu was very uh, stern on that but my I had a lot of barriers when I was growing up and uh, 22 may be the only thing that I could have done. Uh, so I guess I would like to know those at-risk students and I will go from there. Okay, we do need to move along here um, on this. It's taken a while and we got a lot to go, but Commissioner Cummins. I think if we have students at risk, we build in more support, but we don't not raise the bar for them. And all those wonderful conversations that Commissioner Johnson talked about having with her own child aren't necessarily happening in every house in our district, which is why we need to be the ones to raise the bar so we don't um, continue to widen that gap. But we definitely, I, I don't think we even have begun to um, provide every support that we could for different kinds of learners and kids who um, maybe aren't achieving. I also hope that every class that we have is somehow geared towards preparing our students. I don't think we know you know, we have a lot of board members who talk about not wanting to put kids on pathways and talk about not wanting, you know, wanting to make sure we value the arts. Well, if we're now going to say those classes don't really matter once they get out of our doors, then we're kind of going back on our whole child um, initiative. So I don't think, I think having more exposure and more classes and the ability to maybe take an art class or a music class that they wouldn't normally have taken is only going to prepare them um, for more and more that's out there because I certainly didn't know at 14, 15, 16, 17, 40 plus what I want to do with the rest of my life and I just I think the the broadest education we can give them the better and assuming that we need to be the ones to put rigor into some of our students lives because they're not having that conversation at home. Okay, good, good comments. Um, others, other board members have anything to comment on this? Okay, something to ponder on this. Um, uh, I assume uh, we have to. This will. We need to make a decision for the fall. Mm -hmm. I, correct. We need to make a decision in. This, we'll we'll need to make fall. it before the fall. Yeah. Uh, but this will go back to policy and governance. I think they wanted to hear your questions and they wanted to hear some information from the secondary principals. Okay, great. So they can formulate the pol first draft of the policy. Okay, great. All right, thank you everyone for the presentations. It's very interesting. Um, nice talking about education. All right, um, any public comments on, on this uh, topic? No. Okay, great. So next on our agenda is the Wisconsin Public Education Network uh, discussion. Um, Commissioner Hambuck Boyle had brought this up as an agenda item. Um, the WPN, you know, it's been in existence um, for a couple of years, and it's a collaboration of groups and individuals um, committed to uh, public schools. And um, she proposes uh, that we consider joining that, um, and uh, so we want to open up that discussion. So go ahead, uh, uh, Commissioner Hambuck Boyle, to describe uh, a little more. Um, several months ago, I think uh, last fall, October, November, um, the Eau Claire School District was approached to become a member of the Wisconsin Public Education Network. It's a collaboration with the Wisconsin Association of uh, Excellent Schools um, in being a strong supporter for public schools. And since we belong to other organizations within our community and our state, um, I decided to get a perspective on what the WPEN actually is. So instead of just taking what I thought of it, I did call the Wisconsin Association of School Boards and talked at length with Dan Ross Miller, who is the legislative person within WASB. I took like five pages of notes and had an hour and a half conversation with him. 
Um, he has already sat at the table with the WPN prior to um, their reorganization. And then um, I talked with uh, Tom Beebe, who kind of sits in that role right now and wants to retire. And what they're trying to do is to take the Wisconsin Public Education Network and allow it to be a conduit now for all the grassroots kinds of things that are happening in the state in support of public education. Um, I can't predict what that will look like except that um, I'm offering or giving you the information to see if Eau Claire wants to be at the table for those discussions. Um, I ended up also, because I wanted a little more perspective, I always think if you get both sides and you kind of can put lots of knowledge in your head, you come away with your own perspective. Um, I talked with Ellen Lindgren. She is the president of the Wisconsin Association of Excellent Schools and also a board member in Middleton, Middleton Cross Plains. I gave board members this document that they put together um, relative to the um, ideas for school board resolutions and letters that have been supported by WASB and what the WPN supports as well. And then I also talked to several soups down at the um, Every Child Every Day, the 94th State Education Conference recently last week, just to kind of get where they were coming from, because it would be interesting from different districts. Um, and you can see on the executive summary the districts that have already started to um, become a member of this group. Um, many of the soups and the school board members I talked to at the um, convention um, expressed extreme concern about school funding, which is part of what this group would try to have a state voice for. They'd also, um, they want to use the districts that become members to hire a half-time person, maybe eventually full-time, to help those community conversations within the state relative to school funding um, and to become a bigger voice as opposed to all the little grassroots pieces that are out there. So I just wanted to research it and bring it to the board to see if you want to think about possibly becoming, I don't know, what was it, the 8th, 9th, or 10th district to become part of this body to start this robust conversation in support of public schools in our state. Great. Thank you, Chris. So I think um, what we're thinking here is a discussion about uh, what you think about this, and you know, we certainly could put it on a resolution next time. You don't have to support it or not now. Um, we could have a, a vote on it next time if, if, if uh, we agreed to bring it to resolution. But I think right now, just in general, do you think um, it's a good idea to go to resolution next time? Uh, the, the amount that um, I think, believe it's the annual fee mm -hmm. is uh, approximately $3,000. So it's not that much, uh, but it's more, I think, a discussion of what the board thinks about it. And uh, you don't have to commit either way. We could just vote on it next time quickly if we wanted to. So any discussion about it? Commissioner Duax. I had a question about uh, the role of WASB as opposed to this group. Do you feel like there's a conflict of, of any kind between the groups? Because I think WASB does support public school education. Yeah, I, and that was a question that I knew would be brought up. That's why I talked to Dan at great length. Um, I, I think this is how I look at it after talking to all the different entities. I think WEAC was at the table too. I did not talk with them. Um, right now, WASB represents school districts and pretty much needs to keep a middle of the road, nonpartisan um, role because all people from all walks of life belong or participate in school boards. And so they would just be a person at the table, not the entity running this conversation in support of public schools. They are in support, yes they are, but um, they have their own role relative to the support that they give school boards. Um, when you say at the table, you mean the WPE at mm -hmm. the table, mm -hmm. okay. And right now WASB is not a member. Um, Dan said they have not joined, they didn't have it in their budget. It isn't that they wouldn't necessarily be a member in the long run, but right now they can be at the table as well, but they're not a paying member to help get the ball rolling in the state um, to um, have a bigger voice for school funding, which I think we're at a tipping point for, which we all are aware of. Uh, Commissioner Zhang. So how, how would this work if uh, 
if we decide we want to join, would one of us or two of us be going, or would it be administration or staff? I think we'd have to decide who would represent us. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be. A, that would actually. It's an important point. I think. Uh, I would guess a board member, but I don't know. Actually, Commissioner Cummins. Um. I might agree with everything on here, but I also think we are nonpartisan school board members, and I think there's a reason that we, that. I wouldn't want to just move forward right away with this without more discussion because again while I could or could not be for everything on this paper and for their agenda I don't represent a community that that is a hundred percent for this agenda so I would need more than just this conversation in order to move forward with it um, especially if there is a fee and we are committing our tax dollars Okay, that's a good point. So we would have to uh, outline other information that we would need to help with that decision. Uh, Commissioner Fu. I don't want to miss the opportunity to work at the state level to push an agenda that is essential to a school district or any school district in Wisconsin. Uh, Education is very important, and whoever's in office in Madison steer resource to his or her direction. And if the community doesn't have a voice, then uh, the people who are suffer are the students, the learners. And our future is rest on children, not politicians. So I would like to have the opportunity to know more about how. Um, this networking will represent an advocate for the best interest of our students' future. Not to close the door too quickly, but at the same time, not to uh, quickly jump into something we don't fully understand. Okay. Other comments? Commissioner Duas. Well, I just feel like I don't have enough information and I, I agree with Charles about that. Okay, um, so I've heard uh, several say uh, some more information. So um, just to give a little guidance, uh, just some ideas of uh, w would you like something directly from WPN, like like outlining who they are and what they do and so forth? Would is that something you would like, or just to give some ideas for at least uh, Commissioner Hamlock Boyle, if she wants to move forward with this. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Ka Commissioner Duax. Go ahead. Uh, have you observed a meeting? You know what their. I just fully know their agenda. I mean, it's it's a political group, and I I have reservations about joining I, something like that. I had that conversation with Tom Beebe as far as the political piece of it, because I I know people would be worried about that, and I would be too, because we are not supposed to be a political entity, and it was not described as a political group it was it was described to me and I have not been to a meeting but I've talked to several people who have as a way to pull the people that are in support of public education and fair funding for public schools and some of the things you can see on the handout that I gave you relative to keeping our public schools the no expansion of voucher um, institute a comprehensive and sustainable funding mechanism for funding schools those rock solid things that we need in order to have our schools be sustainable as we talk about our budgets so that's the conversation so you are actually promoting that or having that conversation on how to how to ha make that happen in our state or have that conversation in, on a bigger level with more people as opposed to keeping it all local and we're all fighting our own local battles on how we're going to um, fund our schools. So I did ask that because I think it's important that we do stay apolitical. I do. Well, and it is a nonpartisan organization, mm -hmm. accurate. Yep. Correct? Okay. Yep. Commissioner Cummins. I, again, I really just want a lot more information. I don't, I don't, don't want to close the door at all because all of these points we talk about all the time and I don't, it's, it's really just for me, I flip it and I think about how I would feel to live in a community where a school board took on an, the opposite of this, and I would be terrified. 
Um, and so um, it's really just let's, you know, in, let's have more conversation. Let's maybe have it in a work session. Let's find out exactly what it means so that we can explain to our constituents why we're committing $3,000 to this organization. Okay. Um, I think if anyone's willing to help Chris do that, it would be much appreciated. I, and I, I appreciate you doing, you did a lot of calls and everything already, so mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Go ahead. Well, I knew, I knew, I knew our board would want that. I mean, I don't think we're going to jump in to do something without having all the information. So I wanted to really form my own perspective first relative to where this all fit. What kind, you know, if you could email me your questions, um, maybe I can get um, Ellen or Tom Beebe to come and, and explain it further. Um, I could do that as well. And I could get your questions answered for you. Go ahead. I, I would... Some of my questions would be, um, how do they stay nonpartisan? What is, you know, what is that in their mission statement? Is that in their, in how they're practicing? Who are they, who are they advocating? You know, who are, who, whose ear do they have? And how the funding, where the funding actually is going? I mean, that's yeah, that's a, a we pay. I'm trying to think what we pay per year for policy, um, our policy review through WASB, I mean, that's not an insignificant membership. Um, right. And I, I didn't want to overstep WASB if they were doing the same thing, but in my conversation with Dan, they are not. The thing of it is that it's hard when you're fighting for school funding in the sense of where we sit in Wisconsin on staying nonpartisan. I mean, that's, that's a real tough thing to do. So maybe we, in a work session, we can talk about where we all, how we all do that, because I have trouble doing that sometimes because I so truly care about and as we all do public schools and and to keep them sustainable so it's a good question Trish I don't know excellent question um, you had suggested emailing you questions mm -hmm. I, I would I'm gonna make a suggestion if it's okay with Secretary Iverson to send them to her okay. so that we do not have a, a discussion happening over email on a topic that so we do not violate open meetings law so that there won't be a back-and-forth discussion so uh, that way you could put them together and then send them to Commissioner Handbook Boyle. I would prefer that. Any other comments, questions? Thanks. I really want to thank you for investigating this and, and following up on it. I, there's a lot of things happening in the state, I think, um, that are important. And it's, it's certainly good to know about these things. So, Okay, great. So we'll try that next, and we'll try to schedule another discussion after we have questions sent and so forth. Okay, all right. Any public comments on this? Okay, all right. So now we have a discussion and possible first reading of policy 424 on public school open enrollment. And um, this was before us uh, before. Um, and it was, I assume it was sent back to PNG with some minor changes, if I remember correctly. Um, and um, if there are no comments to it, and we'll see if there are, we will need to read this, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> and we can take turns doing that, and I will certainly volunteer. Um, any questions or comments about this policy 424? Oh, Commissioner, um, go I've been away, as you know, so um, I read the policy a couple of times, and I just sent a comment to the Policy and Governance Committee that we usually have a shorter statement of policy and then we put the rules in and this whole document is quite long and it's all the rules and everything in the policy so if I've missed something uh, please explain it to me uh, why it's all in one document instead of in two documents Mr. Duck, I think if I understand it right actually the um, statute requires it all in policy. Am I, am I accurate on that? Uh, I seem to remember having this discussion last time. Is that the reason it's in there? It has to be policy? We looked at a number of, uh, when I say a number, we looked at a couple of model policies uh, through WASB and they contained this level of detail. Um, much of this policy is governed by state statute um, and so in, in talking kind of administratively, we thought it best to have it all in the policy as was demonstrated by WASB. Okay, so we're relying on their model, Yes. basically. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So, no other comments? So, are we ready for a first reading? Oh, yes. Okay. So, I guess we will need to do a reading. How about, I don't know, we could do it page by page or section by section. Um, how about, um, who, who wants to volunteer first? And I, I, should we, <laughs> we could just go across if we want. Okay. I don't care. Commissioner Hambuck Boyle, you want to start? And um, I don't know, maybe do up to number one. Number two? Okay. All right, we'll have that. Okay? Yes, that is fine. Why do each do two? Huh? <laughs> each. <laughs> so, Trish, where am I cut off? <laughs> I go, go to. Pages, so if you each do two. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Okay, um, you go to bullet two, uh, number two. Go ahead. Public school open enrollment, 424. This policy shall be administered in accordance with the state public school open enrollment laws and the administrative rules established by the Department of Public Instruction, DPI, subject to the exception that the school board each January shall act upon any annual space availability determinations for purposes of non-resident open enrollment into the district, the board authorizes the superintendent or any administrative level designee of the superintendent to make all other decisions and determinations that are necessary or permitted in connection with any open enrollment application or any open enrollment student under this policy and under any related board approved rule. However, this delegation of authority shall not be construed to prohibit the superintendent from bringing any such decision or determination to the board as he or she deems necessary or prudent. Non-resident open enrollment students. A non-resident student may apply for full-time enrollment in a public school in the district under the open enrollment program. Applications may be completed and submitted using DPI's online system or by completing the DPI's paper application form and submitting the paper application to the superintendent's designee. The superintendent's designee shall consider and apply the following criteria when deciding whether or not to accept, parentheses, or in some situations, rogue acceptance of, parentheses, a non-resident student's application for full-time open enrollment. One, space availability and waiting lists. The superintendent's designee shall consider the availability of space in the schools, programs, classes, or grades within the district. When determining space availability, consideration may be given to desired class size limits, desired student teacher ratios, overall building capacity, future enrollment projections, the projected number of sections of particular grades or courses, desired program size limitations, and known or projected limitations on available staffing and other resources. Based upon a review of the relevant considerations, the superintendent may recommend establishing space limitations applicable to non-resident open enrollment as needed at a board meeting held in January. At that time, the board may act on that recommendation. At a minimum, any annual determination of space availability shall involve at least a declaration of the district-wide number of non-resident open enrollment applications that the district intends to accept in conjunction with the subsequent regular application period broken down, one, by grade, although two or more grades may be combined and treated as a single grade, and two, by any established special education program or service that has identifiable space limitations. However, in any year in which the board establishes a space limitation in any grade program service, the board's determination of space availability may also indicate at the board's discretion in light of its assessment of the relevant factors that no space limitations are needed in certain other grades, programs, services. If the board has taken action in January to limit the number of spaces that will be available in any grade, grades, programs, programs, or services for applications that are submitted during the regular application period, i.e. for enrollment in the following school year, then the district's consideration of non-resident alternative applications for open enrollment shall be limited as provided under DPI's administrative rules. The district's consideration of non-resident alternative open enrollment shall be denied. Commissioner Zong. Okay. 
The method of random uh, selection used to determine which applications will be approved when there are more applications than available space. If the district receives more student applications during the regular application period for full-time enrollment than there are spaces available, the district shall determine which students to accept on a random uh, basis, uh, subject to the following exceptions. A. Students who are currently enrolled in and attending school in the district, excluding part-time attendance by a student who is is enrolled in another public school district, a private school, a tribal school, or a home-based private educational program. B. The siblings of any students who is currently attending school in the district, excluding part-time attendance by students who is enrolled in another public school district, a private school, a tribal school, or a home-based private educational program. As individual applications are selected and considered within the random selection process, the district grants consideration to certain sibling applicants as required by DPI rule. S uh, specifically, if the uh, district determines during the random selection process that there is space available to accept the individual students whose application is under immediate consideration, when the district shall give, then the district shall give immediate consideration to the application applicants of any remaining sibling sibling applicants in the same family who applied for open enrollment at the same time. Uh, the ap the applicants of any siblings who is entitled to preferential consideration under the this paragraph shall be denied if there is no remaining space uh, in such siblings grade and or in any special education program or service that may be required for the sibling. The methods used to randomly select applicants applications will be will need to be different depending on for example the district's approach to the uh, guarantee preference issue identified above and the policy the proc procedures used sh the procedures should also describe whether the random selection is conducted from a district wide pool of the remaining applications or after first segregating the remaining applications by grade the procedure should also account for specific requirements found in Chapter PI 36 of the Wisconsin Administrative Code that directly affect the random selection process. For example, the DPI rules currently provided that 1. If a district policy establishes a separate random selection for each grade, then the district shall first randomize the order in which each grade is shown. 2. A student who is a child with a disability sh shall, shall be included in any random selections for the student's grade prior to consideration of the availability of any space in the special education required by the student's IEP, and three, if neither currently attending students nor siblings or of currently attending students are guaranteed approved, then both such group of applicants shall be granted equal preference to available space spaces. Waiting lists for acceptance of open enrollment applications into the district. A. The superintendent's, the superintendent's designee creates an administ, administ, uh, administers. Okay. Let me know if you need some water. Um, <laughs> waiting list for applicants' applications received during the regular application pro, uh, period that are initially denied due to space limitations 
B, the superintendent's designee does not administer waiting lists for current year open enrollment applications submitted by non-resident uh, students under the alternative application procedure. C, the superintendent's designee creates an and administers waiting list for the assigned of accepted open enrollment applications applicants to specific schools slash programs for which the applicant has expressed a preference. All right, uh, Commissioner Duax, maybe do three and four. They're both uh, not okay. too long. Students with disabilities. If the special education or related services required for a student with a disability are not available in the district, or if there is no space available in the relevant program services, then the application shall be denied. In any instance where an application is submitted by a student with a disability, but there is no current IEP available for the student, the district will use the procedures defined in DPI's administrative rules to determine whether the district has the appropriate special education program or space and also to estimate the amount of basic and special education costs for the student. If a non-resident student receives his or her initial individualized education program, IEP, while attending the district under open enrollment, or if a non-resident student's IEP changes after the student begins attending school in the district, or if the district has approved an application for a student without an IEP and it is subsequently determined that the student is a child with a disability for whom there is either a record of a previous special education evaluation or a prior IEP based upon such evaluation, then the student may be returned to his or her resident district if the district determines either that the special education or related services required for the student are not available in the district or that there is no space available. I'm going to move this on up now. Students referred for a special education evaluation. This is paragraph 4. An open enrollment application shall be denied if the non-resident student has been referred or identified as having a possible disability but has not yet been evaluated by an IEP team in the resident district. To the extent permitted by DPI and assuming other acceptance criteria are and continue to be met, such a student's parent or guardian may request that the district reconsider a denial under this criteria if the IEP or a finding of no disability is forwarded to and reviewed by the district and if the district concludes that such reconsideration sh would not be prejudicial to any other applicant. Five, discipline re related criteria. The term of an applicant's expulsion overlaps with the proposed period of open enrollment. Consistent with state law authority, the district may deny the application and prohibit the enrollment of any student whose term of expulsion for any lawful reason and regardless of when the expulsion occurs from any public school, independent charter school in Wisconsin, or out-of-state public school overlaps with the proposed period of enrollment. Superintendent or designee will meet with the student and family slash responsible adult to determine appropriate educational programming. The student shall be enrolled in ECASD. Acceptance of a student does not automatically allow them access to a specific school or specific program. Placement of a student is conditional based on consultation with the resident district. B. The term of an applicant's recent expulsion from school does not overlap with the proposed period of open enrollment. The district may deny an application for full-time open enrollment in the district if a review of the student's disciplinary records indicates that the student applicant has been expelled by any Wisconsin school district at any time during this current school year or preceding two school years for conduct falling in any of the four specific categories listed in the open enrollment statutes. C. Disciplinary matters that are pending or that become pending while the application is under consideration. Subject to the limited exception defined in paragraph 4-E below, if any disciplinary proceeding involved con involving alleged conduct falling in any of the four specific categories listed in the open enrollment statutes is pending at the time the district <coughs> notifies the student of his or her application status, the district may deny the application. D. 
Applicants must continue to meet discipline-related approval criteria after initial acceptance. The, dist the district may revoke the prior acceptance of an open enrollment application if the district determines that student is, in fact, subject to a current expulsion order that would have disqualified the student's application under paragraph 4-A above. In addition, subject to the limited exception defined in paragraph 4-E below, the district may revoke the prior acceptance of an open enrollment application if, at any time prior to the beginning of the school year in which the student will first attend school in the district, the district determines that the student either has been expelled or become subject to a pending disciplinary proceeding as described in either paragraph 4-B or paragraph 4-C of this policy above. E, limited exception. In situations where a student's application was denied, including as a result of the revocation of an initial acceptance due to a pending disciplinary matter, the district, upon the request of the student's parent or guardian, will reconsider the status of the student's application if both of the following conditions are satisfied. One, the district is able to determine that the prior pending disciplinary matter has been concluded in favor of the student. And two, the district concludes that considering possible acceptance of the application would not be prejudicial to any other applicant. Um, uh, Commissioner Cummins, if you could do the first page of six, perhaps. Truancy related criteria. A, an open enrollment application shall be denied if the student was habitually truant during any semester of attendance at a district school in the current or previous school year. B, pursuant to the district's applicable truancy and attendance policies of the district determines that a non-resident student attending school in the district under the open enrollment program is habitually truant from school during either semester in a given school year. The district may prohibit the student from continuing to attend school in the district as an open enrollment student in the succeeding semester or school year. Under no circumstance shall any student have their open enrollment terminated under this paragraph unless a district has clear documentation that one, the parent or guardian or student knew or should have known that the student's open enrollment could be terminated for habitual truancy and two, the student had at least one notice and opportunity to correct the truant behavior before being found to be habitually truant or before terminating the open enrollment. The district's relevant truancy and attendance policies are outlined are as outlined in policy 431. Best interest determination under the alternative open enrollment application criteria and procedures. If a parent or guardian applies for open enrollment under the alternative open enrollment application criteria and procedures and relies on the best interest of the student criteria, the district shall review the information and rationale provided by the parents or guardians and make a determination as to whether the district agrees with the parent or guardians that attending school in the district pursuant to the application is in the student's best interest. If the district determines that the attendance would not be in the student's best interest, the application shall be denied on that basis. A full-time open enrollment application can also be denied if a non-resident student is ineligible for open enrollment under state law, e.g. for the student does not meet the age requirements for school attendance or for early admission, the resident district does not have a four-year-old kindergarten program as offered by the district, etc. Or the application is determined to be invalid, the application is incomplete, untimely, or in excess of the number of allowable applications. Assignment of accepted applicants to the school to a school program. The district shall assign non-resident students accepted for full-time open enrollment to a school or program. Any preferences identified by the applicant cannot be guaranteed. In making such assignments, the district may give preference in attendance at a particular school or program to residents of the district. Any admission requirements and prerequisites for attendance in any specialized school or program that apply to resident students also apply to non-resident students. In addition, any non-resident open enrollment students must meet the in-person physical attendance requirements established by law. Request for early admissions to kindergarten. The district does not evaluate a non-resident open enrollment applicant for possible early admission to four-year-old kindergarten. Commissioner Johnson. The admission C policy 421. Is that where I'm picking up? Reapplication. Uh, the, district does not, the district does not evaluate a non-resident. It's oh, okay. top of the page. I, oh, okay, I was thinking she finished that section. The district does not evaluate a non-resident open enrollment applicant for early admission to five-year-old kindergarten. C policy 421. Reapplication. After a non resident student is accepted for full time open enrollment in the district and begins attending school in the district, no reapplication is required in order for the student to maintain continuous open enrollment. Transportation. Student transportation and the cost thereof shall be the responsibility of the non resident student's parents or guardians, subject to the following exceptions. <coughs> Low income parents and guardians may apply to the DPI for reimbursement of costs of transportation in accordance with DPI's procedures. Two, the district shall provide transportation for a non-resident open enrollment student with a disability who is attending school in the district if it is required in the student's IEP or otherwise required by law. Three, upon request of the student's parent or guardian, 
the district shall provide transportation to non-resident full-time open enrollment students without charging any fee if there is room available on a bus on a regular route and the student is picked up or dropped off at a bus stop on the established route except that if the bus stop on the established route is located within the boundaries of the student's resident school district the resident school district must also approve the transportation arrangement rights and privileges to the extent required by state law non-resident open enrollment students attending school and the district shall have all the rights and privileges of similarly situated resident students and shall be subject to the same rules and regulations as resident students and open enrollment students eligibility to, to participate in interscholastic athletic activities is subject to the rules and regulations of the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association WIA resident open enrollment students <clears throat> Resident students may apply for full-time open enrollment in another public school district in accordance with state law. An application may be denied if the resident student is ineligible for open enrollment under state law, e.g. the student does not meet the age requirements for school attendance or for early admission. The district does not have the same program offered by the non-resident district, etc. Or the application is determined to be invalid e.g. the application is incomplete, untimely, or in excess of the number of allowable applications. The district may deny a resident student from attending school in another public school district or from continuing to attend school in another public school district if the cost of the special education and related services required in the student's IEP would place an undue financial burden on the district, taking into account the district's total economic circumstances. However, if a student with a disability has submitted an alternate alternative excuse me application based upon a determination that the student has been a victim of a violent criminal offense as further defined and addressed under state law then the district may not deny the application based upon a finding of an undue financial burden if the student has applied for open enrollment under the alternative open enrollment application criteria and procedures authorized by law the district shall deny the student's open enrollment if the district determines that none of the criteria relied on by the student to submit the application apply to the student However, prior to denying an alternative application on the basis that the parent or guardian, guardian did not provide enough information to allow the district to assess whether the student has been the victim of repeated bullying or whether open enrollment would be in the best interest of the student, the district shall offer the parent or guardian an opportunity to provide additional information. I think I read more than my share. Charles, do you want the last two? Paris, okay. or you don't have it open. That's fine. That's fine. I'll read it. It's almost done. <laughs> transportation. The parents or guardians of a resident open enrollment student shall be responsible for student transportation, except as otherwise provided by law. Requests from other school districts to provide optional transportation to resident open enrollment students to from locations within the boundaries of the district shall be denied. Appeals of open enrollment decisions. The student's parents or guardians may appeal a district decision regarding full-time open enrollment to the DPI by following the deadlines and other procedures established by the DPI, except as otherwise specifically provided under state law or under DPI rules. Whew. All right. Thank you, everybody. I assume there's no public comments on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I assume we, are, we will be ready to uh, vote on this next time in the resolution. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we don't do a second reading normally. Anyway. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay. All right. So uh, next on our agenda is uh, just a follow-up on the WASB resolution. It's just that we want to do a short um, follow-up on that. And uh, uh, Commissioner Hambuck Boyle uh, kindly uh, represented us there. So any comments on that? Just quick. Um, I did. I was the delegate that represented um, the district for Catherine at the. Um, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. And um, all the resolutions listed in the executive summary were passed. I just wanted to pull out the one that was most controversial, which was Resolution 1517, Teacher Shortages and Alternative Licensure Pathways. Um, it did pass 176 to 126, but um, there was a lot of debate on the floor. Um, I wrote a quote down as to one board member who got up in response to a uh, rural district who said, um, you have to take what you can. And I thought that was telling in the sense of what's happening now with hiring people in smaller districts and maybe even with us eventually when positions are really tough to fill. And um, they, as far as shortening or doing alternative license or pathways, lots of people talked about the slippery slope and the idea that you have to keep, which it did say in the resolution, appropriate experience, knowledge, skills, um, 
in the subject or content area and rigorous training and pedagogy assessment and classroom management. So um, that was the one that um, we had most debate on. And I got up on the floor and said something. <laughs> Great. Uh, question? Go ahead, Commissioner Cummings. I have a question for you about that, Chris, because my understanding of it and maybe what another understanding of it might be there might they might be far apart and I'm just wondering where the conversation landed there if it was if there if it was a very black and white argument so my understanding of it when I read it and looking at potential teacher shortages is okay as so you've got somebody and they went into business or they went into um, they got an English degree and they were in journalism and then 20 years down the road they they would like to go back and teach and alternative licensure and like if there is some pathway besides going back and getting a four-year education degree not what I heard stated by our governor which is just some sort of competency test and, and there you go anybody can get in the classroom I was in the camp of we're gonna need to find other ways to to shore up some of, and also in a rural district one of the arguments that I had heard before was they might have somebody who is licensed in math and did a minor in music and while it would be ideal to have somebody that was a full-time music teacher who was able to get that undergrad they might not have that luxury so do not offer that to students or do not offer Spanish because this person only had a minor um, that was what I thought it was but I'm concerned that my support for that put me into a camp that I probably would not have wanted to be in I, I, I think your points well taken I would say that everything you said is right but it kind of depends on who's interpreting it. And um, the rural schools, you know, I know we have our own um, things to, to worry about, but they worry about, uh, you know, a school psych. I've seen them fighting over a school psych because they, they need one, you know, and we don't necessarily always have, you know, experienced that. Um, the, I was on the floor in the del to do this one day at the next, and that was the same day, almost identically, or the next day that um, uh, Governor Walker talked about the alternative for um, middle and high school, um, just having a, a bachelor's, and that you would take a competency test. And he put that 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 was put back on the DPI to develop that. So I'm not sure what that would look like, Trish. So I mean, yeah, I think we have to stay on top top of it. That's why I said it's a slippery slope. I mean, I. I think as educators, we stay so on top of that to know that the people that are educating our kids are the best and the brightest that could possibly be in front of them. And that, that was what I, in essence, said. You know, There's other ways to do it, I'm sure. Oh, Commissioner Duax. Well, I'm disappointed that it passed without, without some uh, proposal from DPI. Uh, I think it undercuts people who do spend the four or five years training in a specific field and so I don't know what this means when it's passed by WASB. My concern was why are we having this conversation? Why is, aren't we having the conversation about fair funding for schools? I mean if we had fair funding for schools we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's right. so. Good point. Uh, thank you for attending that and doing that. Commissioner Hamill Boyle. Uh, public comments on WASB resolutions? Okay. All right. So the last um, on our agenda for committee reports is a proposed school year calendar. And you might remember from the last time uh, we referred it to administration to uh, provide some recommendations for us to look at. And so we have three proposals to us with us. And um, the superintendent will discuss those and have some more discussion about it. So as you requested last time, um, the input and feedback that was collected from the Parent Advisory Council, from the district principals, and from comments sent to your voice uh, was shared with the calendar committee. I will also say that we informally discussed the student feedback, even though we didn't have anything in writing that Jonah had reported on um, at the school board. And Hannah, we didn't have yours, but we assumed it might be the, uh, about the same. Um, so when the calendar committee reconvened to consider the feedback, the committee reviewed and analyzed the pluses, the deltas, and the questions that were sent into uh, the board for their consideration. Um, 
After that analysis was done and categorized, the committee spent some time in conversation uh, focusing on a question about what surprised them in the feedback. And I think that one of the things that we noted was that um, for every plus, um, there was a contradiction. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that you find when you deal with a calendar is that it, it can be, people have multiple perspectives on it. Overall, the comments were fairly supportive. Um, and we looked at um, the idea of the, the start and ending times of school. Uh, on the proposed calendar. And one of the charges of the committee was to separate the uh, idea of flip-flopping the schedule of times with the elementary and, and high secondary schools to a, another recommendation. So the, the charge of this particular committee was just to look at the school calendar and to present that to you first. Um, we noted that in the feedback, elementary staff wanted even more time for parent-teacher conferences and some flexibility in how those conferences were held. Um, some people had some concerns about the breaks, particularly in terms of the summer slide. Um, and I think one thing that surprised the committee were issues which they categorized as trust issues in terms of whether or not the time that was set aside in the breaks for professional development and for collaboration would be used in that manner. We saw that coming from parents and community comments and then on the staff side there was a desire to want to know exactly how that time would be used and whether or not um, there would be specific times within the day designated for uh, professional development, specific times designated for uh, collaboration, instructional planning, data rollouts. Uh, they wanted some spe specificity uh, to that listed on any calendar that was adopted. And so they more or less categorized that as issues of trust. Um, I asked the committee to identify some priorities. Uh, based on the priorities that they discussed as a calendar committee and also that they identified from the feedback that they uh, looked at. Um, so some of their recommendations were that we would keep the uh, professional de uh, development and instructional planning days throughout the year. Uh, we might look at modifying some of the days in August and the use for student days. Um, there was some discussion about the importance of keeping the PD Wednesdays. Um, there was some feeling that it was important to keep uh, a set end date and to clarify the need for more time for inclement weather because um, as we move from counting days to counting minutes and hours, we are then responsible for any time that is missed. So if we close school for a day, that counts as a day. If we have a two hour delay, we must count that two hour time period within the time that we're missing. So while we may have had, you know, what, two point, what was it, Patty? 2.3 average days over the last four or five years, we have had several delayed openings and some early dismissals. That would have to be incorporated into the inclement weather time. So they wanted a clarification of that. Um, they thought that it was better to perhaps take some of the, uh, to consider taking one of the, um, professional development uh, collaboration days perhaps in, in February or April and use that as an instructional day rather than adding uh, a fifth day to the inclement weather time. Um, so as a result, um, we went back to the drawing board, uh, developed 
two other calendars. One is based on a very traditional calendar that we've had in other years and one that is very similar to the one that we have now except that it has fewer inclement weather days going from five to four and it reduces the number of minutes that would be needed for that time at the secondary level. Um, so James Martin and Heather Grant are going to represent the committee and they're going to present the options and they're also going to try to address some of the themes and questions that emerged from the feedback that the committee considered. to turn on, huh? Um, so, yes, I'm Heather Grant. Thank you for having me here again. I thought maybe if I just made a routine of coming here every two weeks, you guys can help me with that whole weight loss thing I talked about last time. So I'm happy to report I've lost a few pounds since last year. You're lucky. Year. You're fine. So if I keep coming back every two weeks, you're just going to help me with that. So, um, no, really, I prefer not to be back here two weeks from now. So I'd be happy to be in the audience. But... Um, and Dr. Hardebeck did such a nice job introducing this that she actually answered and covered some of the stuff that I was going to cover tonight. But really, as our committee met last week, there were a few questions or comments that came through in the feedback that we felt like should be addressed. And as I said, Dr. Hardebeck already answered some of that for you. The, the biggest question we were hearing is, why, um, either why are we building in five snow days, or what is the amount of time we really need to build in? And um, the, the committee struggled with that question too. We don't know the exact right answer to that, which is where you guys get to vote on that. Um, but we did think it was important that everyone understand if there's a two hour delay or there's an early dismissal, that would now be counted because in the past when we counted things by days, if we still had a two hour delay, that day counted. And now that we're counting hours and minutes instead of days, that would be very different. So Dr. Hardebeck already spoke to that. Um, the other thing, um, I know that Commissioner Spin Spindler brought up a question about summer slide. And if we are lengthening summer in this calendar, what does, um, what does that do in terms of the loss of um, student learning over the summer? So our, that's something also our um, committee really looked at. And what we learned is that whether summer is 10 weeks or 12 weeks or 14 weeks, there's pretty significant summer slide. And so whether we got done on June 3rd or June 10th, we weren't gonna be able to remediate summer slide with just the school year calendar. And so um, a result of calendar committee work and then actually some work that we've done through our teaching and learning department, we have really revamped the summer school program at the elementary level. This year it's gonna be very different than it has been last year. And I, as I was kind of making some notes about that, I thought it might be um, nice sometime down the road for us to come and share some of that with you about the changes we're making. But all of those changes we're making are designed to remediate that summer slide piece there. So just know the calendar committee did not say, no, we don't have to worry about that. What came out of that was a whole other piece of work that I believe has been very powerful and we're very excited about at the elementary level which is then going to feed into changes at the secondary level too. Okay. And then this one other question that came up was, um, why would we bring forward a calendar that has fewer instructional days for kids, even though you're adding instructional minutes? And do we really get the same bang for the buck when you add 16 minutes to a day versus having six more days? And I know you've heard the research, we've quoted it I think three times for you already, but really, we've all in the research we read talked about nations who are more successful than us, who have less student contact time and more instructional planning and professional development time for teachers. And we also heard in our working conditions survey that we did a few years ago that staff were crying for the opportunity to collaborate together. And we felt like it was incumbent on us as a calendar committee to provide that for them. So with that, I'm gonna segue to James, who's gonna share with you the three options that we have. Good evening, um, James Martin, uh, 
Technology Coordinator out of DeLong Middle School and also um, an elected representative for the Eau Claire Association of Educators. Um, I'm going to share real quickly, highlight the differences between the three plans that were presented to you um, through your board report. I'm going to use the, uh, if you have a chance to bring up those individual calendars or, or refer to them, that would, I'm actually going to grab the document camera too. So the, uh, the three calendars, the, the one that was delivered to you with the proposal um, that was labeled calendar number one, this is the one that we went through in detail um, at the last board meeting. And nothing has changed on that. So that still is there as it was. Um, and in the board docs, it was highlighted as calendar number one. Calendar number two uh, is one that I'll talk in more detail about in a moment. It, it, is, it is structured after calendar number one with uh, really one tweak that created a cascade of, of adjustments. So I just want to highlight what those are in a moment. And then calendar number three um, that uh, Dr. Hardebeck, I believe, referred to is, is more of a traditional calendar. We called it the traditional calendar. It's modeled um, after this current year's calendar, which has a lot of things that were new to us um, that I'll highlight also, but uh, again, really moves us forward with, with something that we're currently working with. So in looking at the, the highlight of the board report that was put out there, so the first one, uh, when we compare calendar one to calendar two, the one that was already presented to the, the modified one, uh, and again, this is the modified one that was modified after, the doc after Dr. Hardepick had the calendar committee review um, the feedback loop. And then she asked for some priorities and recommendations, and then she took that information and worked with a subgroup to come up with um, a modification. And, the, and so this calendar number two is that modification. So calendar number one has the guaranteed nine professional development days. Um, it adds 24 minutes at the middle school level and 14 at the high school level. And then it has a, a, a different level of additional inclement weather days. And really when you l try and figure out what is an inclement weather day, it's essentially how many minutes and ultimately hours and therefore days are we exceeding the requirement from the DPI at each level. So it's anything that you see as inclement weather is in excess of what's required by the DPI to make sure that we meet um, their requirements. So it was 8.4, uh, 6, and 5.1 at the, at the different levels. So that was calendar number one. The modification that was brought forward um, really has one main change. And uh, again, that creates a cascade of, of adjustments. It takes the April 11th professional development day and uses it as an inclement weather day, uh, if necessary. Um, so it now no longer has a guarantee of nine professional development and instructional planning days. It, it's eight guaranteed, with the ninth one being a floating one, uh, depending on how the weather, how the winter treats us, and, and how, how uh, the the buses can safely commute. Um, so when we take that and use that as our f uh, bonus or our, our floating inclement weather day, we're able to reduce the total number of minutes within um, the middle school day and within the high school day. And so the addition of minutes at the middle school becomes 19 uh, as opposed to 24. And at the high school, it becomes 12 as opposed to 14. And then you can see how the, this adjusts the total amount of inclement weather days or minutes. Um, elementary is at 8.5. The middle school drops to 4, and the high school drops to 4.4. And so again, to hit that target of five days, uh, we had this option of April 11th. Um, and April 11th, um, just to be clear, that would be currently is a professional IP or instructional planning day for the entire district, and it would convert to a school day for the entire district. So we wouldn't modify one school schedule or one level schedule versus another to keep things very simple. It's we are either going to have school or we're going to be working through the professional development and instructional planning that's in place. Um, so those are those Just are the be key clear, differences between oh, those. So, so that really is the main difference between the two. That is. That is. Um, and we can circle back to that in a, in a moment just so that we highlight 
uh, one modification in the current calendar, today's calendar, that we would uh, that that we would suggest for next year, um, if the five inclement weather days is a is a target and a requirement, then we would need to add some time to this current year's schedule in order to build the additional time in over the course of the year. So even if we move forward with the current calendar that we have ha in place today um, as an option, we'd want to add three, day, three minutes at the middle school level and five minutes at the high school level in order to hit uh, that target if that's, if that's a requirement, if that's one of the parameters to hit. Uh, you mean DPI's requirement for minutes? Uh, well, is that what you mean? in order for us to, if we want to build in five days worth of inclement weather, which is a new target, uh, we would need to add that time to hit their targets. Right. Yes, that is correct. Um, and just for what it's worth, I mean, I don't want to discount uh, this year's calendar at all. If you were to read through some of these things that are here, there are some inventive ways that we try to work in um, a hybrid of, of needs and also ways to try and address the instructional planning at some levels and, and professional development at some levels. But um, taken as a whole, it is, it is not as complete of a solution relative to um, the other two options that we already pr proposed. So any questions to understand the differences between the three that I could help with? Questions about the calendar themselves. Commissioner Duex. I just, I'm not getting the 15.5 uh, elementary. Why do they need so many? It's, um, so it's not that they need so many. What it is is the DPI requires um, many fewer hours of instruction, almost 80 less hours of instruction for our elementary students. So uh, we exceed that by, by f in this example, over 15 days. So we have our, our children, K through, uh, our, our K through 5 students in class with their teachers for 15 days above um, what is currently um, required by the DPI. So that's what that, uh, if you frame it like that, that might help. Other questions about the calendar itself? Okay. I just want to make one more comment. As James was talking about the proposed calendar number three, is if we were to go with that, which is very similar to what we're doing now, what we would have to do for instructional planning and professional development purposes, which is what we're doing now, is releasing teachers and four-hour blocks from the classroom which is um, very expensive, you know, so we'd have to figure out the financial costs for that with the budget. Um, but also we heard from parents in the PAC feedback, like, thank you for proposing a calendar that allows my child's teacher to be in front of my child instead of a substitute teacher. So that's just another piece if we are to go forward with that to know that that's one of the components of that. The other thing I forgot to say in my earlier comments, because I was too nervous, was, um, the other reason, we got some questions or concerns about why did you put those days on Fridays and Mondays? Like our teachers just trying to get a free day off or easier weekend. And really that was a result of PAC feedback. Parents told us, if you're gonna need a day to, without kids, please do it connected to a weekend. So as families, we could take long weekends or do something like that. Not, that was not designed around teacher needs at all. That was designed around parent feedback that we got. Um, Heather, since you're up, I actually had a question about your comment of, about fewer instructional days. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't quite understand the argument. I know the idea that this professional development will imp obviously improve right. instruction and so, so forth, but I don't see, I mean, that would be true regardless of instructional days longer right. or shorter. So. Well, part of the, ch one of our parameters was same number of work days for staff. So if we can only have the same number of work days for staff and one of our priorities is to have professional development instructional planning as their work days then the balance is... So essentially it's a trade-off. She's talking it, about contract days. Yes, right. yes, right, I know. Right. Mm -hmm. So then in the research, though, the research told us that in the nations that are more successful, that teachers who spend more of their time in professional development and collaboration have a greater impact on student achievement. So I just want to rephrase that to make sure I understand. So basically the argument is that um, professional development that meets that model, more, more days, offsets losses due to less time in school, days time. Is that, because really you got a trade off right now if you had a set number of days by contract. Right, with the fine, I mean we had It's like this certain, much versus that much, so this, right? Right. And so the hope is, the research shows, you know, improving this for planning for teachers right. will help student achievement, but what happens when this is shorter, does 
You see what I'm saying? What, what is, oh, the hope is that this is greater effect. Is that, is that accurate, really, the argument? Yes, and that our, um, the hope would be that when we have better prepared teachers with better professional development, that the instruction that kids are getting on those fewer days is higher quality instruction so that kids are actually learning more and their teachers are actually in front of them more frequently than having a substitute teacher. Okay. I just I just wanted to make sure it was yep. clear to me and everyone else. I, I'm not going my opinion on it at the moment, but yep. okay. Uh, Commissioner Hambuck Oil. So could it could it be restated in the sense that better professional development, but it's it's laser focused pretty much on what our needs are as a district related to each and every student. Yeah. And yeah. so then we will look at our data when if this is in place to make sure that I mean that should that should tell us that. Yes. Right? Mr. Johnson. Um, was the um, 189 or 186 days is that um, is that a parameter that you considered lifting at all or is um, you know, obviously it would be there would be a certain significant impact on morale but other than that what would be the implications for the district uh, you're talking about in terms of the contract days for teachers that was one of the parameters that I gave the committee um, in terms of keeping the teacher work year at the same number of days that they've had in the past. Um, I didn't feel that we had any direction from the board in terms of changing those contract days. Um, we're trying to use the calendar as a tool to address some of our gap issues by giving teachers more opportunity to plan and, and to um, focus on the needs of students who may not be achieving to the levels that we want them to. So, um, you know, I think that as a superintendent, I wasn't ready to recommend additional days to the contract. Uh, and some of that has to do with the cost of adding those additional days. The cost of um the hourly staff would be the cost of the hourly staff would be cost of transportation um, I think there'd be a number of costs that would be involved in adding additional days to the school calendar well there wouldn't be cost of transportation because currently we have kids in a school 178 days and we're looking at having them in 170 days I think that there would be uh, maybe anticipated or expectations from teachers that if they were going to work more days that they would be paid uh, at a higher salary. Um, I think for support staff that come in on those days there would also be the expectation of additional pay. Are the support staff involved in all of these professional development days? They are to some extent. Um, I think what you know one of the things that we'll be looking at is you know, where can we provide professional development for support staff that kind of uh, ties into the school improvement plan or to some of the district initiatives, or maybe in some, in some instances in terms of building their skills. Uh, but I, I don't think it would be the expectation that all of those days would be, you know, days without pay or days off for those employees. Well, and I don't know if the entire board got the question, but there was at least one hourly staff who asked that question. If it, you know, if they're not required now, they're going from 178 contact days with kids to 170 contact days with kids. So if they are in food service or in a, you know a direct special education assistant dealing with specific kids, they're looking at a pay cut because they're not going to be needed with kids um, that many days so um, okay thanks for answering that uh, Commissioner Cummins you know I I keep trying to figure out sort of how the board can move forward on this you know this is our third committee report on the calendar um, and 
I try to do it in a way that doesn't discount individual concerns, but I feel like a couple of things. One is I feel like we got hijacked by start times, um, and I'm glad that's been separated out. I think it's interesting that one board rep said, yeah, we wanted to kind of know about board about start times, and the other board rep said, people are worried about their after-school jobs and gym times. You flip start times, after-school jobs, and gym times, it's like, where do we even begin? So I'm glad we're at least separating that out and just talking about the calendar and the calendar as a tool to bring about our vision. Um, I would love it if we funded our education system in this community to extend into the summer. And if we did that, wonderful. We're still looking at a percentage of time between instructional time and professional development time. And I think that's the piece that's missing from the board's understanding of this. And, and when we get these questions that have elevated to the level of requiring the committee to meet again, and these trust issues, and we talk about treating people as professionals when we talk about it's a professional decision to, to decide if you should stay home on inclement weather days. Okay, keep that conversation going when we're talking about treating our teachers as professionals and we don't need to monitor um, what they're doing with their time or assume that they're trying to get Mondays and Fridays off to have an extended weekend. I mean, it just frightens me that that's where we're at. The research is incredibly clear. The research that this committee brought forward is incredibly clear. Top nations in education support high quality teacher education, equitable competitive salaries, mentoring for beginners, extensive opportunities for ongoing professional learning, and teacher involvement in curriculum. It's clear, this is what, this is what other nations do. Um, Linda Darling-Hammond, who's one of my favorite education writers, on a report, summary of studies confirm what teachers already know. Professional development activities of under 14 hours appear to have no effect on teacher effectiveness. Meanwhile, well-designed content-specific learning opportunities averaging about 50 hours over a six to 12 month per period of time are associated with gains of up to 21 percentile points. 20 percent of U.S. teachers receive this kind of professional development in any area. These opportunities are routine for teachers in high achieving nations. Our teachers spend 80 percent of their time in instructional delivery. Those nations spend 60 percent of their time. So if you want to extend into the summer, great. Let's go to referendum. Let's fund it. We still then need to provide the proper percentage of professional development time to support that additional time. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like um, I'd like to hear from every board member on this. Uh, make sure that the uh, um, administration has an idea of what people are thinking. So um, I have mine that I will, but I don't want to jump in yet. Commissioner um, Fu. I'm leaning more toward number two. I'm encountering number two for the reason that A, the calendar mirrors the university calendar. A lot of what's district program also involve the volunteer of UW Eau Claire students or from somewhere else. Uh, B, the current assessment that we all receive indicate that the one strength that the district has is the value of PD professional development. And I don't I'm not going to be surprised that there will be more intentional and well coordinated so that our curriculum can be tied to PD. I'm not surprised. I believe if we were to give more time for the staff PD, uh, we will give more attention to coordinate that intentional PD. And I think it will even strengthen the district's data, academic achievement. So I, I like to see more of um, professional development. And we can't do that if we want to stretch the um, calendar longer. So I would move more toward less. I mean, early, uh, early closing date, like June 3rd. And that fits number one or number two. Hey, great. Thank you. Others? Um, well, since there's some hesitation uh, from others, I'll, I'll say much of what I've said. First, I want to 
thank Heather and, and James for answering some of my questions from last time because that was one of my frustrations last time <laughs> is that I didn't feel like some were answered. You've answered weather days, you've answered shortening the school year. Um, I'll get back to about lengthening the, the, um, the year uh, or the summer. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, not the summer, but the uh, day time, the question about that. The one thing about start times, um, I would disagree that this is hijacked. It's just, I think, a legitimate concern uh, from some board members, at least myself. I've heard from a lot of community members. In fact, just two weeks ago, I heard from a retired teacher, when are you going to change start times? Um, so I think it is an important issue. Um, looking back on it, if I had known that a uh, calendar proposed would have changed times of students more, I would have considered saying, well, maybe we should flip what we're looking at. We maybe should have looked at start times first and gotten some ideas of where we might go with that and would it impact it before we did this. But that, that's hindsight now. Uh, but that's looking back on it, I think that probably would have been better at least to get some idea of what we're thinking about that. Um, in fact, I'd, I'd be much more comfortable with, for example, option number two, if, if I could see something that would say, yeah, it's still, it's still reasonable possible that we could do it. You know, uh, uh, student transit came up uh, last time with some some uh, ideas for times. If I had saw that, okay, it's possible for them to implement it the other way around, I would I would feel you know much more comfortable uh, with that. Um, so now it's sort of like the carpet horse before the horse. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, on, on kind of a broader note, and I think um, Commissioner Cummins mentioned this. You know, there's that question of professional development days for staff and the uh, contract days. You know, a as an adjunct faculty member at UW, um, I'm on a semester to semester contract. I spend a couple months in the summer doing it. All that preparation changes. Flipped my classrooms recently for free. I did it. I'm not paid for it. And I don't think that's right for myself or for teachers. So I would not propose that teachers are expected to do professional development without pay. Um, so I want you to know um, I, I would not support that. Um, so uh, in a way, I think what's happened here is we've got this framing of based on what I was discussing with Heather a minute ago, teacher time versus student time. And I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, what we need to do is have parents and students and teachers join together saying we need quality and as much time as possible for both. <laughs> and ultimately, I think that's perhaps a winning referendum type of argument, um, that we need more money for professional development for teachers as well as for kids to stay in school. So ultimately, I think that's the broader argument that we need to make to our community on this. So that's my, my comments right now. I, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't commit to how I vote, but I understand where you guys are coming from, and, and hopefully you understand um, where I'm coming from. And I, I totally agree about the research on it, um, but I, I would just, especially at start times, I would feel a little better if I'd known that we can make progress on that. So thank you. Yes, Commissioner Duax. Well, being a teacher myself for many years, I am absolutely committed to professional development. Um, every single year, I did something to impact my teaching. Uh, I went to workshops. Occasionally, I got financial help from the university to do it. But most of the time, I did it on my own time and on my own budget. And I was involved in professional organization uh, for many, many years, in fact, my whole career. Even if you just get one idea from another teacher, it's worth it. Uh, you need that spark in your teaching. And my students appreciated the fact that I was going out in the state and nationally to do that work. So they knew I was up on the latest things, and I, I prided myself on that. As you can sit in your classroom day after day, but if you don't reach out and get some inspiration, know what the latest books are, the latest studies on different things. And in my area, it was uh, voice science, which there was a lot of new things, which didn't come real naturally but it has to be there. So it doesn't really matter to me whether it's number one or number two. They're quite similar. But I think we're on the right track. I have a question only about how this will be evaluated, and I'm sure 
Jim Schmidt's got some ideas already. So, um, that I think it's, it's definitely worth our effort to do this. And I want to thank the calendar committee for putting so much time and research on it. Um, I don't have much patience with all those vacations that are being planned right now. I, I want to focus on what kids are learning and what teachers are learning. So it's nice to have a long weekend once in a while, but I don't think anybody has that much money, disposable income. I like the comment about evaluating and thought about how to evaluate how it's going. Oh, that's good. Uh, I, I forgot to say one thing is one thing when I was discussing about you know, how do we pay if we want extra professional development time beyond the school year. That might be a topic for the compensation committees to discuss sometime. Other comments? Question? Uh, Commissioner uh, Zhang. My uh, two comments. Uh, summer slide, that was my very big concern going into this and it was uh, somewhat addressed. Uh, the, the reason for my concern is uh, from the research I read is uh, the uh, students from the students that are uh, lower income or minorities are the one that's heavily impacted by this. Uh, but it was somewhat addressed so I will have to read, read up uh, more into that. And uh, these schools, or well, these nations that are doing better than us, uh, are they typically, you know, in school longer than us as well? You know, these are some of the questions that is going through my head when we are uh, talking about this. Of course, that goes back to a money issue because longer, longer school years, more money has to be paid out. So uh, we're doing what we can here, and maybe this is a segue into referendum. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions? Commissioner Amberboy. Uh, I really don't have anything to add except to thank the committee and the work they did and the board for the discussions we've had. Um, I think it's been pretty powerful, but I think the time and energy and the thoughtfulness and the research that went into it makes us um, better as a district and connected better as people within our district to make us the best we can be. So thank you. I would agree, and um, I actually think the three meetings have been really useful. I mean, if, if we had this many questions, think about the community member out there looking at it. Um, and, and I want to say something about the trust issue. I don't think there's any doubt that any board member uh, here <laughs> doesn't trust that the staff are doing what they need to do. But I do think I can see that some teachers or not uh, parents may do that, and I, I think it's our duty as board members to try and correct that as we run into the community. So, thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, were you going to say something? Superintendent? Well, yes. I, I was just going to follow up and, and kind of conclude this by saying I, I think one of the challenges that school boards face, and this is any school board, is making decisions that the community cares deeply about and that they expect you to make these decisions. While at the same time, as board members, you're being true to the goals that you've established for yourself and for the district. And so, you know, I will be making a formal recommendation to you in the next meeting. Um, it's been really helpful to me and I think to the, the committee, which I'll continue, I'm sure will continue to reach out to me and, and talk about what the recommendation should be. But I want to thank the committee. Um, my first opportunity to work with the committee was when we came together to review the feedback. And it was, uh, it was really a very thoughtful and research grounded discussion. And I, I, I appreciate the work that they have put into the three calendars now and thank them for their feedback. I, Can I, I, ju I just ahead. wanted to respond to a couple of questions that came up just sure. because I think one of the calendar committee when we did meet this last week, um, we're very in invested in everyone understanding why we brought forth the proposal that we did and making sure any questions get answered. So um, as I've sat here for the last three meetings and questions come up and I just want to answer them and I haven't ever got up here and done them, I'm like, okay, tonight I'm going to do it. So um, first of all, um, Commissioner Spindler, you talked about student transit and I did have an opportunity just quickly today to talk with Jim Pye and he has been working on this for Dr. Hardebeck, um, proposal two, 
and my understanding is just like proposal one they they could make it work you know we don't know the exact start and end times but they could make it work just like they could for proposal one as an it you mean uh, flipping start times you mean no 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 you were no. say I thought I heard you say I couldn't really vote for proposal one or two unless I knew the start and end times like we did like he pre no 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 two weeks no ago. what I meant was that the flipping start times oh, okay. is feasible still then I misunderstood. That, that's what I meant. Yeah. So, um, and then I know one other thing that came up is um, I think it was Commissioner Cummings. You talked about the systems or the CEC assessment that we just had, and I know there hasn't been a full report on that yet. But I was able to sit through the fi the first oral report of that, and what we heard is um, we're lacking some systems in our district to provide support for our staff and for our students to really do the important work that we need to do. And I personally believe this calendar proposal is one of those systems that we could start to put in place that would be more effective for building that base for our district. Um, and then really, I could tell you tons more about elementary summer school because I'm so excited about it, but I didn't want to hijack tonight's pr presentation about that. So for Commissioner Zhang, I hope in the future we get to do that because really we have some really cool stuff happening for elementary summer school. And I can just guarantee you it's really driven by fixing that summer slide issue so great thank you and I, I just want to echo what the superintendent said you know to me this is one of those topics that is the intersection of education what the school district does what the community feels I mean the calendar kind of represents a lot of that and I think this kind of discussion is really important for that and I think it's exactly what we should be talking about so I'm I'm glad that we spent the time on it so and I hope I hope other board members are fine with that uh, Commissioner Johnson I just um want to reiterate what you said about the trust issues I guess I didn't hear that at this table maybe it was in some of the written comments but um, I have no doubt that if you have activities planned on a Friday or Monday that you'll be doing that work um, but I do want to just clarify those of you who have been sitting in the room I'm sure heard it clearly but um, I don't think the leader telegram represented my concerns um, the specific quote from the paper two weeks ago was that I couldn't vote for something Depending based on the days that is certainly one of my concerns I'm still like to see more research on the number of days and hours kids go to school um, and I'm still concerned that you know especially low-income kids will not be with their mentors in a safe place with meals um, six extra days a year but I can't vote for a calendar that adds time to the day that's not in conjunction with the the conversation about flipping start times and so I'm with rich on that that that's really my my biggest concern is adding 12 or 19 or 24 or 14 or whatever it is without having the conversation about flipping start times because I feel like this adding those times will create a bigger barrier to that conversation. So that's what I can't vote for. Okay, thank you. Um, before I forget, because I often do, are there any public comments on this? <laughs> yeah, I just want to add one more sure. thing from, okay. the, Go ahead. from the committee. Uh, one other thing that came out of the committee that uh, we discussed was that and we've we've touched upon it but it would be a concerted public relations a concerted educational program where we help the community understand the and share the research that shows that investing in uh, the professional development of your teachers and giving them the collaboration time has a direct uh, and a significant impact on your uh, student performance and the time with the students and the removal of, of the guest uh, guest teachers as they're called are substitutes at the elementary for example where the teachers are uh, have to be pulled out of their classroom and the students are are led by a guest teacher or a substitute teacher that that time isn't near isn't as productive as having our trained professionals in front of them so one thing that as we talked about uh, in the committee was that if there was a way if this moves forward either proposal one or or the modified proposal two that we talk to the community about there is research there is evidence that shows this and that should go out hand in hand with um, perhaps the new calendar so agreed uh, Commissioner Cummins um, I think we're gonna just have to agree to disagree on process and whether three meetings of an hour plus each on this topic is keeping within the key work of school boards um, but there is a piece of this that is the school board's work and that is what happens out in the community so if we have our students not in the classroom more days that community piece and that conversation about making sure that every organization we 
have at our um, disposal is aware of that and what kind of camps can we get in place what kind of um, you know I'm the wonderful summer school opportunities um, you go into the Boys and Girls Club in the summer and you're hard-pressed to see summer slide when you see all that's going on there all day every day so I think that is our work I think that's on our side of the fence um, and it's not that I don't think these conversations deserve um, time and energy it's just that the time and energy that goes into committee work and how that is received by the board is a huge concern of mine moving forward the other piece I wanted to add because it's come up before in terms of the cost of this and you know comments have been made in the past well maybe people should take care of this on their own time physicians who treat children typically get between five and ten professional development days a year paid for and a budget of about twenty five hundred to about eight thousand dollars a year to do that if it's a well child they might spend 40 minutes a year with a child a well child who maybe does two checkups a year so I would think that as a community our professionals who spend all day every school day we, we could you know we certainly need to fund that more appropriately okay great thank you any final comments anything from the public we do have a comment from the public thank you just state your name please I'm Kate Mullins and I am uh, the EL teacher at Meadowview Elementary and I have been on the um, calendar committee and um, at all three of the meetings I just have one thing to add because I have heard um, the board bring up the flipping of the start times and why we didn't consider it and why we won't now and um, we did a lot of reading of research regarding the effect of start times and there will be a proposal that will be coming from the committee to the board in I think the next board meeting but um, I think all of you got the same research um, and in that it clearly stated a number of times that in order to do that effectively it takes two years there's a there's a long time schedule here if we're going to do this and do it right and so that's why it can't be part of this calendar for the upcoming school year we felt because if we're going to do it we want to do it right thank you I very much appreciate that because I knew it was on your agenda to be looking at thank you anything else okay great great discussion thank you everybody thank you those in the audience um, any uh, agenda items from board members no okay all right I would accept a motion to adjourn so moved. We have a motion from Commissioner Hamburg Boyle, a second from Commissioner Cummins. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are now adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. This program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.